the Zachary Engineering uh, Studios facility here at Texas A&M University, University, where we are uh, having our final event uh, today, the, uh, the presentations and award ceremony for Aggies. Invent Aggies. Invent is an entrepreneurship, engineering entrepreneurship uh, event that helps our students in engineering here at Texas A&M not only develop their engineering um, prowess, but we also want our students when they go out there to possess uh, that entrepreneurship mindset. We want them to think about you know, how to maybe start their own company, maybe how to get their innovative ideas out there. Uh, you know, that's what it's all about. My name is Shayla Rivera. I am aerospace class of 83, long time ago, before computers almost. Um, and I have to tell you that engineering has changed completely. Engineering has changed mostly in the way that it requires the engineer to really be confident, to be able to communicate, to be able to work in teams and collaborate, and that's what this is about this weekend. Aggie's event is an event that asks uh, our collaborating industry partners, in this particular case, is the Los Alamos National Laboratories, who are here supporting us, who provided um, about a bunch of statements, I think 12 or 13 need statements for our students based on uh, nuclear security, and our students have taken on whichever ones they want to work on and have come, in, come together as a team, and today they're going to present their solutions. They haven't been alone. We have had 12 mentors here the whole times. Uh, so let's give a round of applause for our mentors, please. They have I will have them introduce themselves a little bit later. We also have four or five judges here today from uh, Los Alamos National Laboratories as well. They're going to be here helping our students and looking at their ideas, looking at their presentation, and then asking them questions about the process of they went through, how they thought about it, and then we want them to you know, challenge our students as well as maybe continue giving them the guidance that they need. So I would love at this moment to have our judges introduce themselves. Bob, why don't we start with you? I believe your microphone is on. There we go. I'm Dr. Bob Putnam. I'm the uh, director of the Technical Applications Office at Los Alamos National Laboratory's plutonium facility. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Brad Beck. Um, I work in our Partnerships and Pipelines office. I am the Workforce Program Director. So looking forward to seeing the presentations. Lee. Afternoon, I'm Lee Perry. I am uh, at Los Alamos, a scientist in the shock and detonation physics group. And I'm pretty excited to be here. This has been very cool so far. Good afternoon, I'm Don Quintana. Um, I, this is my fourth year that I'm participating in this and um, the division leader for weapons stockpile modernization at Los Alamos. This is a, a bittersweet moment because Rodney, who's been leading this at least for the four years I've been part of this, is going to be leaving. And I want to thank you for this relationship that you've, you've built with us over the last four years. Good afternoon. My name is Daniel Preston, I'm third generation Los Alamos employee. Uh, I am the group leader for the process automation control group at Los Alamos. I would have to say I've spent the last couple hours walking through your beautiful campus and I'm reminded by what a wonderful environment it is to just be uh, learning and uh, having these great, great role models. So uh, thank you for having me. Awesome, very much. Let's give them a round of applause. say, Don, you stole my, th my thunder. I do want to let you all know this is about the 44th or 45th, I don't even know Aggie's event, 44th. And it is all thanks to this young man over there that's hiding from the camera. Just let's look at him right there. Rodney Bain, Professor Rodney Bain, who has been uh, our lead in uh, engineering entrepreneurship. He's usually the one doing what I'm doing right now. But today he's trying to pass on the baton. I'm not sure, but I'll take it on. You got it. 
That's it? No, you got to say. <laughs> Ice cream rock. If you ever want to learn how to be a good leader, a good manager of people, a generous uh, manager and a good person, just hang around with Rodney a little bit. I, I aim to one day be like you, as old as you maybe. Anyway, all right. Uh, so we're going to start this event right now. And we are going to ask the first team to come up here. We have, the way this is going to work is the teams will have 10 minutes to present their ideas in only 10 minutes. Uh, if they run out of time, you can, you can line up over there. If they run out of time, the 10 minutes, we are going to be brutal and say, OK, thank you very much. Uh, and then five minutes will begin for Q&A from the judges to the teams. Uh, so, you know, without further ado, I believe uh, we have a clicker here for our team. And the team will, what is your, you're the degenerators, right? Okay, so I will leave you all with our first team. Our team name is the degenerators. You never expect war. This is why our defenses have to be ready at all times. We have plenty of warheads, more than capable of defending the citizens of this country. However, none of this will matter if when we push the big red button, the warheads don't detonate. This is because existing detonation devices don't have a good way of storing energy for long periods of time. Additionally, conventional energy storage methods can be very heavy and occupy too much volume, which is particularly inconvenient in flying systems. With these limitations, our team developed a prototype that can provide reliable access to a power system that can be trusted and deployed at any time. Our system utilizes a difference in gas pressure to create a one-time electric charge that can power a detonation. It is worth noting that this type of system is not only applicable to explosives and defense. Our solution is capable of providing power to systems in remote locations where conventional energy storage is either inconvenient or not possible, such as SOS signaling and long-term space travel. Our solution's longevity, weight, and reliability make it a great mechanism for instantaneous power. It can be the spark to the flame of anything that we need it to be. Howdy. I'm Justin, a master's in aerospace engineering. Howdy. I'm Juan, and I'm a senior mechanical engineering. Howdy. I'm Emily, and I'm a senior in industrial and systems engineering. Howdy. I'm Ryan. I'm a freshman in general engineering. Howdy. I'm Sam, and I'm a senior in electrical engineering. Howdy. I'm Derek. I'm a junior in mechanical engineering. And we are the degenerators. In case of an emergency, there needs to be a reliable access to a power system that can be tested at any time. This system must make use of a pre-existing pressure difference. It must uh, provide an electrical output to a high voltage circuit at 10 watts and it must minimize volume and mass while also conserving 100% of the gas. Taking these requirements into consideration, we came up with three prototypes. The first one is a multiple turbine system powered with, the, not powered, but outputting DC. The second one is a single turbine, but outputting an AC, alternating current. And the third one is a one single one single turbine uploading, outputting, and DC. So here is our actual design. Our working prototype uses a retrofitted bike pump. We pressurize this chamber here. This pressure will be released through this valve. As soon as we rotate this valve, our turbine inside will spin, and this will give us the output voltage. And this is the turbine we chose to use. It's an existing turbine, but it did end up giving us usable results. seen by our Q chart, we have compared our existing designs to thermal salts, which is an existing solution to our problem. However, when compared, you can see that our single turbine DC generator is more efficient and lighter when 
compared to even our own designs that we've created? Due to the heavy weight of our designs generated, we can rule out the multiple turbines that are DC powered and the AC generator, as this one requires a transformer, and we have our, our winner, the single turbine, DC. Uh, in this video, we're demonstrating the turbine being able to about 1.3 volts. And now you'll see I'm disconnecting the turbine entirely, releasing the mechanical buttons that are keeping them in parallel. And now when I hit this button, they go in series and discharge double the voltage, lighting the light. All right, capacitor energy test, 16 PSI. Three, two, one. All right, gas conservation test, 10 PSI in three, two, one. Turbine operates, we decide to model it so we can calculate the efficiency. We use this air compressor used to pressurize a bed of the air bed, and with a known pressure difference of 38 pascals and a known volumetric flow rate. From that, we can calculate the ideal power output. This is the voltages, or the wattages that we calculated after measuring the voltage across a known load, outputted by that same system in the previous slide. The ideal output of the turbine would be 0.38 watts. Our turbine, in practice, was able to put out 0.017 watts. That means a 4.4% efficiency. This relationship right here shows that the power is equal to the volumetric flow rate times the pressure differential for any given turbine. The unique part of this turbine system is that the pressure difference drops as the turbine speeds up. So the pressure is depending upon time. That means the volumetric flow rate is depending on time. That time is very difficult to calculate because that pressure is discharging so fast. It was a bit of a challenge, but we estimate that the volumetric flow rate lies between 1 to 12 liters per second for the 10 to 60 PSI we tested. To characterize the power that our system outputs, as well as the energy that it stores, we devised some tests to gather some data. You can see here that we took a resistor, put it in line with the turbine, measured the voltage across that resistor, and with that we can calculate the power that is dissipated. Using this data, we can then extrapolate using a power fit and find that if the pressure in this device is equal to 446 PSI, we predict a max instant power, instantaneous power of 10 watts. And to characterize the energy that our system outputs after one run, so that's pressurizing the system, opening the valve, looking at how much energy is captured, we can connect a capacitor with the turbine, measure the voltage across that capacitor, characterize the energy that way. You can see, as the pressure increases, so does the energy. Further research we really want to explore with the, the power system uh, explicitly. Uh, originally we thought we could only use a DC turbine because we didn't want to compromise the volume and the weight specifics that an AC turbine would then involve a transformer. After more and more research, we really like the idea of using this voltage multiplier system with an AC turbine. Because if you notice in the video prior of the electronics demonstration, I'm having to switch manually with those switches from being in parallel to then series to dispel double the voltage. This system, however, does all of that passively with the help of diodes. And as you can see, it scales up. So future research for this application involves researching into AC powered turbines as well. And we also have to increase the efficiency. Although this turbine was really good since we pulled it out of a commercial use motor, we could also scale this efficiency up. That turbine that you see right there is from the Department of Energy, and it has an efficiency of about 42%, and so it's a microturbine as well. Therefore, if we use this turbine, we'll get higher efficiency. We also need a better seal. We would like to thank everybody at Los Alamos, and we would like to thank Doug, our team lead, for helping us. We truly, truly enjoyed working on this project, and if given the opportunity, we would love to continue research on it.
anybody have any questions? All right. The degenerator have five minutes, uh, judges, to ask questions. So, so great talk. Um, did you consider uh, to larger designs as, as, you, as part of this effort? Uh, did you did you look into possibly scaling up this concept for maybe future applications? Yes, we looked at scalability, especially in the, the voltage aspect of it. But we really did focus on the minimization of the size, and that offered quite a bit of restraint as far as turbine output. But yes, we did look at how much can how much power can you really get out of a small turbine. Great talk, thank you. It's good, good, a lot of good work in a short amount of time. Um, so you, you characterized efficiency in terms of power efficiency. Did you uh, compare how much you, uh, energy you could store in the capacitor relative to how much energy was stored in the compressed gas and compute efficiency that way? We did not do that, but we, we could do that to show how much pressure, we, or how much, no, sorry, how much energy are we losing of the energy in the pressure form, and then that would be Awesome, thank you. Great presentation, love the intro. <clears throat> Who is the artist? Very, very nice, that is uh, really compelling. So I'm curious with your, your prototype, how, how did you arrive on that volume? How sensitive is your prototype to that volume? How much margin do you have? Well, so the main thing we focused on is pressurizing, the, pressurizing this to a certain PSI. And what we wanted to do was take a set volume, a set resistance value, and with this PSI, we were able to plot a curve and then calculate the desired um, specs of 10 watts is what we were trying to produce, what it would take to get there given this volume. We've also done the calculations to show what vo other volumes would work. Um, however, with this given volume, we were able to just calculate the PSI versus wattage output and then uh, estimate up to what we need to do. Thank you. Any other questions from the judges? We, we lost our microphone, so I'll, I'll go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, no, really great presentation. I agree. I love the visualizations at the beginning, so it kind of gives a really good key into the problem. I um, did have one question, and you covered it in the end. You said the longevity. So keeping that, and I was actually curious if you had any comments about, you know, concerns with um, pressure for a long of time. So. <laughs> Longevity is being greater than 30 years, and so pressure shouldn't decrease over that time. This battery theoretically creates itself, so when compared to other sources, they could be technically inconvenient, and batteries, after we did research, even the most powerful ones really will begin to degrade after five years if they're not being used. This can be stored and stagnant for upwards of 30 years and can still be used properly. We're good? The judges do. No more questions? All right. Well, there you go, the degenerators. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Well done. We are going to give the judges a little time so that they can get their uh, scores in. In the meantime, we'll bring uh, the pre-Avengers, set them up to get ready to go. Um, you know what I'd like to do, too, uh, while we, you know, We'll see the judges giving them time to do this. Where are some of the mentors? I'd like to have some of the mentors introduce themselves. Here they are. So why don't we get three of you right now to introduce yourselves while our team is setting up, please. Here, there you go, go. you got it. Hi, I'm Doug Tasker. I'm from Los Alamos. I'm a, a, let's say, a detonation physicist with a heavy interest in electrical engineering. And I, I, a deep love for working with great young people. So thank you for the opportunity. Hi, I'm Krista Torrance Moore, um, class of 2020. I work in the Advanced Engineering Analysis Group, uh, focusing on the material models that we use for our system uh, analysis and simulation. Hi, I am uh, Kevin Tu from Los Alamos. I am a component development engineer. Uh, 
I brought them a fuel cell challenge that we'll hear about later today. So really happy to be here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. We'll introduce more mentors here in a little bit. Um, very good. So I just, I think the judges are all good to go right now. We lost one. I'm not sure where he's back there. He's good. Okay, so right now we are going to proceed then with team, the second presentation for the, ap for the afternoon. And this team is called the Pre-Avengers. Take it away. Imagine, if you will, that a bunch of burglars could hack into your smart home security system completely undetected. They are able to, while you're away from your house, um, to open your doors um, remotely. They're able to burst all of your water pipes, again, while you're away from home, and they're able to completely wreak havoc on your AC system. So once you come back to your house, you find that your door is, for some reason, unlocked, all of your stuff is a, um, a flooded mess, all your records are destroyed, and the air is completely the wrong temperature for that time of year. On top of that, a bunch of your stuff has been stolen. But once you check your, home, uh, your safe home security app, it shows that nothing's wrong. What would be your reaction? Would you panic? Now let's think about what would happen if this happened to critical infrastructure on a big scale, such as nuclear facilities. What would be the response worldwide if we saw this on the news? Some kind of panic and confusion, I'm imagining. But the good thing is, it doesn't have to be this way. Th the problem that our group has been working this weekend is figuring out how we would address uh, this hypothetical. If critical nuclear infrastructures are being cyber attacked and, and uh, they can experience catastrophic consequences if the operator doesn't react in time. For those of you familiar with Stuxnet, it's a unique piece of malware developed over multiple versions in 2008 and 2009 that was designed to inconspicuously destroy uranium enrichment centrifuges at the Natanz nuclear facility in Iran. The malware was designed to transmit itself like a virus across networks and lie dormant until it had infected its target, at which point it would blind all user interfaces with readouts that appeared normal because they were recorded from untampered with units. Meanwhile, the virus took control of valves, rotors, and other control systems in the centrifuges and intentionally destroyed them. Even though the facility network was isolated from the World Wide Web, it was still vulnerable to manually inserted thumb drives containing the virus, and as centrifuges continued to unexplainably fail and break, the Iranians did not consider the cause of failure to be external tampering because they trusted that the data on their screens was accurate and considered their network untouchable. Stuxnet is the most infamous example of this kind of cyber attack and is exactly the kind of attack we mean to prevent from being brought upon us. And we must succeed undoubtedly if the nuclear power industry is to take on a larger role in domestic energy infrastructure. Stuxnet should serve as a stark reminder that no digital network is safe from external conquest, and it is for this reason that Generation 4 nuclear reactor facilities, and all critical infrastructure for that matter, must require mechanical verification of any and all digital readouts so that operators may not be blinded from the physical reality inside their systems while they are being made to destroy themselves. It is our goal to arm reactor operators with unquestionable trust in their control system interfaces, so as to give them a fighting chance in disarming the attackers and to not be led astray by intentionally misleading digital readouts. If the operator is blinded, staff at the facility cannot minimize the attack. Therefore, we need to alert the operators that an attack is underway and in order for them to be able to react in a timely manner. And prevent any further damage. Okay, so introducing our solution, Cybertex. So Cybertex is a network of sensors, uh, of passive and non-intrusive sensor that will be put in parallel on top of the current control system, SCADA in this case. And it will act basically as a second form of verification and alert the operator in case of a cyber attack. So features of Cybertex. What makes Cybertex Cybertex? Number one, it can be deployed in any region of the current reactor, making it mobile, mobile, accessible, and flexible. It is non-intrusive to the current sensor as well as the reactor themselves, making it um, meaning that it doesn't hurt or destroy the current system in place. 
And number three, it will function independently from ins existing network, making it a rel reliable second form of ver verification. Number four, it will alert the operator if there's a large enough difference between the two sensor systems. And number five, it will, uh, it will have a user interface to display the two data sets. The, the video in the next slide shows a demo of such. The, the video in the next slide shows a demo of the SCADA system, but on a breadboard. In this case, we're measuring temperature but any unit can apply. The temperature sensing system for the nuclear reactor. On the right here is the primary SCADA system, and the, pr the light on the left is the backup system, which is non-intrusive and detects temperature change on the outside to check if there are inconsistencies. When heat is applied to both sensors, the light bulbs go dim, meaning that both systems are working. In this scenario, when the primary SCADA system is duped and heat is then applied, the right does not go dim, but the left goes dim. Left, in this scenario, this shows that there are inconsistencies between the sensors, and therefore all staff will be alerted. The difference in voltage across both of the light bulbs can be fed through a differential off amp subtractor circuit and compared an in analog. So the graphic here shows a nuclear reactor. While they may seem complicated, they're actually quite simple. There are three containers, a the reactor itself, a heat exchange or steam generator, and a condenser. There are two independent loops of water which exchange heat between each other and generate steam which rotates a turbine, generates useful energy. So SCADA in the front is an immovable system. It was made 20 years ago, cannot be changed. If you want to change it, you got to take everything apart and put it back together again. If there are a cyber attack that happens, they can feed false information to SCADA, making the staff completely unaware of any problems. However, cyber attacks would be present and allow a, a creation of a uh, creation of the ground truth so that they know what is real. Cybertex, because of its flexibility, its passive nature, and its non-intrusiveness, is interchangeable and can be put anywhere you need in the system. If you don't like it somewhere, you can put it somewhere else. So why Cybertex? Cybertex directly compares with SCADA to establish the ground truth meaning that the operators will know what's true at all times. Because of its low cost deployment, you can apply many different sensors in many different places in the system, and that is cost effective. Because of its passive sensing ability, uh, it does not control the system like SCADA does, but instead senses when things go wrong, if they go wrong. And because of this, that they cannot be attacked directly, in addition to SCADA at the same time, this is an additional layer of security. And here's what we will be doing next. Our next step is to build a testbed to, uh, to put in place a proof of concept in the ground and demonstrate the feasibility of, the, of our system and conduct more research to feedback and improve our uh, proposal. So we prevent the, an alarm, particularly in Texas, in our region. And Texas remain calm, and agis continue to shape the future. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now it's time for our thank you very much. Great presentation. I should continue to shape the future. They will. Judges, do you have any questions for this great team? Yes, sir. So it sounds like you uh, have multiple types of sensors depending on where you want to implement, so heat or voltage or differentials like that. Uh, did you look at any other uh, mechanisms such as mechanical or anything like that? Uh, 
or is everything electronic? Yes, we focused in on uh, comparing two voltage measurements and we were planning on looking into barometric and uh, magne magnetometers as well, but we're unable to get to that point. May I? And in fact, what uh, the test bed on our proposal is to test any kind of sensor. It doesn't matter if it is uh, just digital or electromechanical or just electrical or electronic. So two, thank you for this. Uh, two questions. So the first question is, do you look at any radiation um, concerns with your electronics and how they would deal with longevity? And a second concern is at reactors, there's also a large con concern over uh, the, the storage tanks, you know, the, the pools where you put kind of your exist old fuel. Did you look at either one of those two? Well, building the circuit, considering the materials of the circuit components, I can see that there are issues with, with it if it were embedded in a nuclear reactor. And due to this, since nuclear reactions are heavily based off of chemistry and materials, there will need to be some adjustments to make those things in different materials. And that technology does not currently exist, but it can be further developed in the future. And briefly to the question of the pools, if I'm understanding correctly, you're referring to, are you referring to this set of pools? in this mock-up that we have? Uh, actually, I was uh, referring to, you know, uh, reactors, we have to store our spent fuel on site. Okay. So there's actually storage, which when you look at IEA, a lot of their concerns actually go into how do we also maintain that those are not being tampered with. And I was mm -hmm. just curious if you had looked at any possibilities in that area of the Gen 4 kind of reactors. No, we focused instead on um, the perspective of the reactor operator and ensuring that w that, w that we can verify with as close to 100% certainty as possible that what's on the screen is reflective of the physical reality in the system. All right, no more questions from the judges. They have been stomped, like, uh, <laughs> like Rodney likes to say. All right, let's give them a round of applause, please. The three Avengers, thank you, guys. All right, so we are, while the judges are working on their score, um, I'd like to say a little bit about what Aggie's event is for those of you in uh, our live stream to understand. These students are here all weekend. They get here on Friday afternoon and they are given these neat statements uh, to which they gravitate to. And then they, once their teams are formed, they go straight to designing and uh, and preparing for this presentation today. It is a very intense and immersive experience for all of our students. Um, and I have to tell you that just to see them from Friday to today, while well, every day they give us briefings of what, uh, you know, what they're working towards, is a tremendous difference and they are doing a tremendous job. Um, very good, I think. We're ready, not yet. We have a little bit of time, so why don't we introduce a couple more mentors over here, please. There we go. So, Bob, can you share the mic over there behind you? Thank you very much. My name is Paul Geimer. I'm a scientist at Los Alamos, and my work specializes in non-destructive testing and evaluation with a focus on ultrasonics. I'm Richard Livings. I am an R&D scientist at Los Alamos in the non-destructive testing group. I also focus on ultrasonics, so we have two of us. <laughs> I'm Jordan Schulte. I'm an R&D engineer in the advanced engineering analysis group uh, with a focus in fluid mechanics and modeling. Okay, that was three. We'll catch you next time. Um, very good, thank you. I know these judges have been instrumental in, uh, for our students' team. I know that that is the way that students are describing that to all of us. They're very grateful and so are we. And then I'm gonna ask you guys to think about and tell me what impressions you're getting from our students as we go along. But 
Continuing now with our presentations, this is our third team, and this is, uh, they are the Little Bang. Take it away. Howdy. We are the Little Bang, and this is Thermalite. In computer science. Howdy. I'm Rian Moment, and I'm a freshman in mechanical engineering. I'm Aryan Patel, and I'm a freshman in biomedical engineering. My name is Nathaniel Thomas. I'm a junior in chemical engineering. My name is Raju Azalik, and I'm a freshman in nuclear engineering. I'm Nishi Mishra, and I'm a junior in mechanical engineering. OK. How did we get here? Catastrophes like these happen because we don't know what goes on inside of sealed systems. Pressures build up and up, all without our knowledge until... Tragedy strikes. So how can we tell what is happening inside of these sealed systems? We can't open them up or pass probes into them. For all we know, all sorts of deadly radiation or toxic gases could leak out. This is a problem that requires us to tell with high precision what is happening inside of a container that we can't open and we can't stick anything inside of. Here's how we do it. Say we have some unknown material inside this container and we want to tell what the strain with response to temperature is. Essentially, how much does it grow or shrink when the temperature changes? We can't open it up or get inside, but we can look at how the whole container changes and from that we can determine how the contents of the container changes. With our process, all we need to know is what the temperature is and how much the container stretches. This gives us all the information we need to predict with high accuracy exactly how the material inside is changing. With our technique, we can measure how sealed systems change with temperature through non-intrusive means. Using our method, we can prevent catastrophic failures without having to compromise critical sealed systems. This is Thermalite. Our system deals with two mismatched materials. Take, for instance, this aluminum cylinder and this nylon cylinder. The nylon cylinder is constrained within the aluminum cylinder to form the constrained system, as mentioned prior. This entire system, specifically the nylon itself, is inaccessible. That's where the problem lies. Both of these, when exposed to extreme heats and different varying temperatures, undergo thermal expansion and contraction. That's exactly why we need a measurement for that by effectively, uh, indirectly measuring these temperature, these temperature changes and this thermal expansion, we find a way to prevent any sort of rupture in the system. For instance, this nylon has nearly a five times greater expansion rate than the aluminum. It can cause a rupture in the system as a result if left untreated. Therefore, we've outlined five key requirements, or as listed prior. We cannot penetrate the system. Specifically, we don't want to, we want to avoid drilling holes or applying any external stimuli to the system to avoid tampering with it entirely. Second, we want to measure strain from negative 50 degrees Celsius to 70 degrees Celsius to encompass all at temperature ranges. Third, we want a closed system with two mismatched materials, any materials, specifically nylon and aluminum in this case. And finally, we want a minimal res resolution of 0 0.001 inches. That just goes to show the level of precision you need to perform this kind of measurement. So I'm sure you're all wondering, why is this a relevant problem? So in the modern world, we all enjoy high-speed internet and our electronic devices. Who in here you loves their high-speed internet? I'm sure most of us do, right? So high-speed internet relies on fiber optic cables that are tightly wound and surrounded by tubes uh, deep on the ocean floor and they transmit data uh, between countries instantaneously. However, due to the temperature uh, variation that can occur, the wires are susceptible to damage, and we want to prevent this. And the similar principle is also applied for uh, city electrical lines, which support our critical infrastructure, such as schools, um, such as hospitals, and our homes. And that's where Thermalite steps in to solve the problem. So our team was brainstorming to solve this problem. So when we were solving the problem, we came up with few ideas to solve. So one of the ideas was vibrational analysis. So this idea only works for wide variety of temperatures, I mean densities. So in our case, the, densi the density is change is so little that it's hard to measure. So we ruled this one out. The next idea was electromagnetic radiation. So we penetrate the system with x-rays, but the x-ray 
is cost ineffective because it requires tremendous amount of energies to penetrate the system. So we ruled that one out as well. The one we use is our idea, unlike the other two ideas, our idea uniquely me measures volume, change in volume passively by measuring the, the, the pressure change of the fluid inside the system. Here we have an example test chamber in which we are afraid that the pipes may burst due to a very large tem temperature strain. Now, there's our opponents use varying methods to find that strain, but they fall short of our requirements in a couple ways. Thermal expansion testers use wires directly connected to the sample within the container in order to take their measurements. However, our method measures indirectly, so we don't have to stop the entire process in order to get the measurements. Capacitance displacement sensors also measure indirectly. However, they fail to take into account the intrinsic properties of the materials, so they can't find which mismatched materials are inside of it. They can only use one material at a time, unlike us. All right, so our solution. Our solution has um, a, an aluminum outer container, and, and inside is is. A, 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 a nylon block. Um, so, um, what our solution is, is first we must find the change in volume of the apparatus with relation to temperature. After that, we must determine how much the pressure changes with relation to temperature because we have a fluid that is filling the gap between the sample and the apparatus. So we must determine how much the pressure and the temperature affect the density of the fluid. Once we know how much the apparatus changes in volume and how much the fluid changes in volume, we can find exactly how much the volume of our sample changes. So how do we find this volume change? What we can do is we can calibrate our vessel, as you can see here with our prototype. What we do is we attach a temporary pressure valve with a hydraulic pump as well as a reservoir as represented by this syringe here. What we can do is we can insert a known amount of fluid into the system. And once we do that, we can then determine how that affects the strain of the entire vessel, i.e. how much does it stretch. And we can also measure the pressure change. We can then use this data in the calibration data set and generate these graphs as you see here. Now we repeat the, ex the experiment with the sample inside of our apparatus. Uh, when we look at the system at a different temperature, we can then determine using our calibration data exactly how much the apparatus has expanded or contracted, and as well, we can use our data to determine how much the fluid has actually expanded or contracted. With this, we can then determine how much the volume of the sample itself has changed which is the entire objective of our technology. This was Thermalite, a calibration technique determining the volumetric strain of an inaccessible system. So great, great talk, uh, wonderful work. Did you think about, I mean, this, this um, application is ripe for machine learning. Did you think about um, possibly inserting some machine learning algorithms help you to converge on a solution as part of the application? So we did not consider that uh, simply because there is a very direct, straightforward solution. We just have to collect data, and then we have to look back at it. And that gives us our answer. So in this application, we didn't think machine learning was appropriate. Very nice uh, presentation. Uh, so in the, the example in the beginning, can you give us an idea of the disparity in CTEs between the aluminum and the nylon? Okay. Uh, so nylon has an expansion coefficient around five times greater than aluminum. So this is... Uh, quite a significant difference, and it especially becomes a problem when we are heating, because that means the nylon is going to expand more quickly than the aluminum. 
this is why we have our system, is to characterize this expansion so that we can design for it and prevent rupture. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. And a uh, follow-up question is, um, if you did use modeling, how do you think modeling could impact uh, your project? Uh, do you mean machine learning modeling or? No, modeling <laughs> different CTEs, modeling different uh, materials. I understand. Okay. Um, if we did model it, I know you could use, you know, CAD programs like SolidWorks, you know, Autodesk Inventor, things like that to kind of show strain in like a, like, in virtual environment, and that may be helpful for the situation. We could kind of like see it more visually. So I loved your example in the very beginning with respect to underwater uh, cabling and, and data transmittal, et cetera. Um, Typically, those are designed to not have any kind of a fluid or intrusion, intrusion to them or to detect them if seawater, for example, got in there. Am I correct in understanding that your system requires some kind of fluid inside to be able to verify? Yes, uh, our system does require a very, very small amount of fluid. Um, Although, what we could do is, if we wish to detect seawater, it is conductive, and we are using a non-conductive fluid. So, with, the dis with this design, we'd still be capable of, dis of detecting intrusion of seawater, but we do require fluid inside. So, one of the great things about these things is you always learn something, so thank you guys. Um, so, I did have one question, going back to the seabed. What are the delta T's that you do experience? I mean, I was kind of curious about that when you're talking about them. I, I did something I just was not a familiar with. So, so uh, the change in temperature goes from negative one degree Celsius to about 30 degrees Celsius. So that wide temperature differential causes the wires to potentially expand and can cause issues with data transmission. Awesome talk, thank you. Um, so we talked about this a little earlier in the week um, about the, the um, so the temperature range in your problem statement is minus 50 C to 70, right? Were you able to identify a fluid that, that works well over that, that entire temperature range? Yes. Uh, we were able to de determine that 0W30 oil is actually a suitable fluid. Uh, sorry, we have a slide on this, so. Um, this fluid can still pour at negative 50 Celsius and is well below its flash point at 70 degrees Celsius. And there's also widely available thermodynamic data on motor oil, which is what this type of oil is. Excellent answer, thank you. We have time for uh, one more question. We're good? All right, the little bang. Let's, gi let's give her, oh, you have something to say? So I just wanted to uh, provide a technical document for those interested. Um, Very good. All right, the little bang. Thank you all. You may. Leave. All right, so we are uh, we are halfway through to our break. We're not breaking yet. Three more teams, and we will have a break. So, uh, if you feel like you need to go, you can wait um, a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a, it was a, it's really interesting and fun to watch these teams go from conceptualizing these ideas, briefing the mentors, and getting clarification and clear in their minds as to how it is that they should proceed through the weekend. It is um, is daunting sometimes, it's exhausting, and I have to tell you that, of course, presenting is not the funnest thing for uh, nobody, really, uh, except for me, I guess. But uh, I, what I would say is that these teams have been extremely generous with each other. They, you can see that their support for each uh, team member is just outstanding. It's uh, absolutely in Aggie fashion, and I'm very, very proud of that. So if we are good to go, we're good to go. All right, so now I leave you with our fourth team, which is Spy Kids. Howdy, we are Spy Kids. I'm John Moe, freshman in computer science. I'm Carla Hefkin. I'm a junior in mechanical engineering. 
I'm Enrique Ramirez, a senior biomedical engineer. I'm Harvey Joyce. I'm a junior industrial distribution major. My name is Simon Tsai. I'm a senior biomedical sciences major. I am Pau Forca del Campos, and I'm a freshman aerospace engineer. Nuclear explosions can change our lives in less than 45 minutes. According to Live Science, there are 13,000 known nuclear weapons in the world, and that number continues to rise. Development of some of these weapons happens in secret and military-grade security. To combat this, America has had a history of employing spies to gather intelligence. With Spy Kids, there is no longer a reason to send precious lives into the risk of enemy territories for intelligence gathering. The swarm bots are deployed and then infiltrate the compound to gather information on the presence of radioactivity. Each bot is equipped with a gamma detector as well as a micro camera to avoid detection of enemy threats. By having a swarm, we can have a mesh network where communication is relayed between each swarm bot to bring data out. The problem is that there is currently an inability to discreetly detect nuclear radiation in covert weapons facilities. If a rogue nation decides to secretly develop nuclear weapons, that is information that we want to find out as soon as possible to keep our country safe. We want to ensure that our friends and family and nation live free from the thought of any nuclear threat. Our solution shines light into the darkness and unknown of secret nuclear weapons. Our solution is Spy Kids. Spy Kids stands for Sophisticated Platform for Gamma Ray Sensing Controllable Insect Doomsday Weapon Detection System. We have five basic requirements. First is that it detects gamma and X-ray radiation down to 10 kilo electron volts and also neutron radiation to one electron volt. And then second is that it is mobile and user controlled. Third is that it is quieter than 15 decibels, which is, can be equivalent to leaves rustling. Fourth is that it records data for 60 days straight. And five is that it, ab it is able to transmit that wirelessly recorded, uh, wirelessly transmit that recorded data throughout into the user. In order to discreetly detect nuclear threats, we hypothesize three solutions. The first being an agile micro-sized drone. The second, implanting microchips into animals and electrically stimulating their neuromuscular skeletal systems, and the third solution being a swarm of robotic cockroaches able to communicate with each other. Our chosen solution is the swarm system. It consists of two parts, swarm bots and a mother drone working together. The swarm bots are responsible for infiltrating the facility discreetly, sensing for radiation, and communicating this data to each other. This is made possible by the mother drone. The mother drone is a stealth aircraft responsible for, for carrying the drones and controlling them and acting as a command node. The mission setup looks like this. The mother drone flies over the facility, releases the drones to glide towards the compound using a GPS location. The mother drone con controls the swarm using a secure, a secure software def defined network, and as the robots are inserted into their positions, they hide, collect data, and during nightly flyovers by our, by our mother drone, it gets within the, the range of the drone, collects the data, and flies away before detection. Each of the individual drones uh, have the same set of features. So all of them include a CZT sensor, so this detects uh, alpha, beta, gamma and x-ray radiation. Uh, they're also capable of detecting neutron radiation. So to allow the operators to navigate inside of a facility, all of the drones have a camera uh, at the front of the unit. 
For all communications and controls, there's a long range radio frequency module, which allows the bot to communicate up to two miles away, even when they're deep inside the facility. For mobility, the bots feature feet made of a material, a synthetic material called Gek skin. This allows the bots to walk on walls as well as on ceilings. To allow the bot to move, the legs have these dielectric elastomer actuators, which act as synthetic muscles, which enable the bot to move with minimal uh, noise and with minimal power consumption. All of this is powered by an 11,000 milliamp hour lithium air battery. This is an emerging battery technology, which has 10 times the energy density uh, compared to standard lithium ion batteries. The bot is capable of operating for up to 63 days. This includes 60 days of collecting data and up to three days allowed for infiltration and escape. To conserve power, the bots uh, detect radiation periodically for a total of six minutes of detection each day, and they are allowed five minutes each day to transmit the data. Regarding our drone, we set out to design the most stealthy drone we could think of. This includes optical, infrared, and radar range of electromagnetic radiation. For, electri uh, for the infrared signature, we, des uh, we designed a drone with an exclusively electric propulsion system, which gives out almost no heat, no infrared signature. And with our radar, radar transparent composite structure, our stealth geometry, and our carbon nanotube coating on the drone, which would be black, but we painted the drone gray so that we're able to see it. We are ensuring both basically no radar cross-section. Mm, this is a conservative estimate, one inch square. And we are also ensuring that at night during flybys, it's not seen. It would be VTOL capable so that a likely retrieval of the bots can be conducted in small spaces. And its maximum, of m maximum takeoff weight would be 30 pounds while being able to cruise at 60 miles an hour. These are some of the design decisions and technical details of the drone. So this diagram shows a example of an infiltration. The red dots would be where our drones would be positioned for the long duration of 60 days. The, in the case that the signals that the data collects cannot be sent out back to the mother drone, the blue dot you can see is a travel bot. Uh, that drone will go in and out of the facility once a night so that that data can be sent out. So I'm very happy to announce that we are only scratching the surface for potential with the spy kids. In the future, we hope to improve on the visual concealment by implementing a lenticular lens case design. Uh, we also hope to, increase, or to decrease the size as well as increase the capabilities of the drones. And finally, we hope to equip swappable tools within the drone that allow it to handle any kind of situation uh, that it's thrown into. For example, it can range from uh, audio detection all the way down to search and rescue. We can swap in these tools in order to suit the situation. In conclusion, we want to say that there's always been a problem with detecting hidden nuclear weapons facilities, and current solutions are not expansive enough to be able to do this effectively. That's where the spy kits come in, and with our mothership system, we're able to use that as a center node. We have included a never-before-seen design for the mothership system in order to make it as stealthy as possible. And finally, with lithium air technology, we've been able to make this drone as effective in reconnaissance missions on the smallest scale possible. And to kind of prove that to you, I'd like for you guys to look around. Uh, I bet you guys didn't notice that there was a drone spying on us this entire time. And it's been right under our noses, or if I should say, right under our cameras. And thank you, we're Spy Kids. All right, Spy Kids, very good. So that's what that roach is doing up there. All right, um, judges, any questions for this team? Uh, 
I guess I would say, overall, I'm really impressed with everybody's intro with these uh, visual designs. I don't think I could go back to college and be successful anymore, but very nice, very uh, creative. And drones are really the wave of the future. As, I, as I'm thinking about your, your project, I would be pretty upset if another country was uh, spying on me. And my experience with uh, drones and robotics, uh, if you have this many, a few of them are going to fail. Have you thought about if um, I get a hold of your drone, I'm going to trace you down? Um, have, have you guys thought about that? I, I guess both the, the traceability and how you're going to transmit data so that I don't find out who you are so I can come after you. So this is one thing that we were hoping to include in our future considerations, which would be either something to destroy the memories or something like a small thermite to just subtly destroy the important things. That way, the manufacturing would, details would not be noticed after the destruction. And in addition, the network that the drones communicate on would be encrypted. And some operation that we considered is that the frequency or the channel that they're operating on can change nightly throughout the operation to prevent the facility discovering and tapping into this and hijacking our drones or just observing our activity. So, sounds, sounds great and um, uh, love, love the name. Uh, I once had a component named uh, Maverick that was, I found it kind of reminiscent to your Spy Kids, very, very creative. And I guess at first blush, I thought that your uh, idea here is a little bit fantastic, but as I'm thinking about it here, uh, this sounds more and more reasonable, but in your opinion, what is the limiting factor of technology today of really making this a tomorrow? Um, so with the, the mini drones, the cockroaches, so the lithium air is a new technology, but one of the concerns that we had is that it may not be ready yet, so it would need more development Thank you. Oh, Have so you considered? Also, responding to that question, we um, the nanotube coating is actually being researched. Right now, we would only be able to make some sort of nanotube um, like paint. Uh, can you talk just quickly about the fidelity of your prototype? I is it sensing anything now, or is it uh, more more or less just a mock up? So it's related to my question. Um, you had really specific uh, electrical requirements and power requirements for the, the bot. How did, how did you come up with those requirements if it's a, a mock-up? So we looked into sort of real components, so sensors and, and cameras inside, and then we had some rough calculations for what kind of power consumption you need. And for the realistic um, power consumption when they're deployed, how much would they make with things, and how much protection Awesome, very good. And so, and did, did that calculation include a battery? Did, did your specs have a battery of some kind on there? So awesome. Originally, we had a lithium ion battery capable of only 1100 uh, milliamps per hour. And so, it's like, uh, since we were able to up that to the 11,000, before we could only record 30 seconds of data per day, and now we can do five or six, six minutes per day. Awesome. Okay, we Thanks. have time for one more question. So, related to the battery. Segwaying off of dis, uh, destruction charges and so forth, did you make any estimates on what it's going to take to maneuver these into place where they can then use that limited amount of recording time and transmittal time? And given the type of battery, have you looked at it being your destruction charge if you needed it to be? Okay, Spy Kids, uh, let's give them a round of applause. Very good, well done. Did anybody notice the little drone up there, the little cockroach? See, you have been on YouTube the whole time, even before we started. Very good, I want to bring up, the resonators are going to be next. They're going to be setting up behind me before uh, I, uh, <laughs> the, chef, the mentors are going. It's over there. See the cockroach? Did you get a close-up of it? All right, good. Um, teams, you're doing very well. I really want to remind all of you that when you make, uh, you know, you step up 
to the microphone when you are going to speak. We need you to get, you know, within four or five inches of the microphone so that we can hear you all over the room and in uh, our streaming service. So remember that, this team, you're going to give me the thumbs up. You're going to remember to step up to the mic, correct? Very good. Uh, the judges are still uh, working on this a little bit. I have to tell you that uh, thanks to our sponsors, which is the Los Alamos National Laboratories, these uh, teams are actually competing for scholarship money. So there is uh, some skin in the game here. The students can place a first place team, will receive $1,000, uh, which will be split w within the team, and they will be able to use that while they're going here at Texas A&M University. Whoop, I have to do that. Um, the second team, uh, the second place team will be 500, no, $750, and then the third place team be $500. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these guys are doing this for reals, like they say. So I think the judges are ready, and we are con ready to continue with our next theme, which is the, uh, the Resonators. Take it away. This aging building can't hold the waste for much longer. It is, in their own words, an intolerable risk. They rely on methods that aren't scalable for larger objects. They require the use of tools that interfere with data collecting. And they include complex setups that increase lab time and reduce the repeatability of these experiments. There has to be a better way for securing the safety of these nuclear facilities. Our team has developed the ResTube, a device that uses resonance technology and an innovative suspension method to produce more reliable and accurate test data. The design ensures that our product is scalable for large samples. The suspension method is easy to set up and eliminates the interference from the sources of vibration. And most importantly, the product allows for repeatable tests to ensure consistent and accurate results. Howdy, we are the Resonators. My name is Lohit Alampali, and I am a freshman in general engineering. My name is Rhea Kaithal, and I'm also a general engineering freshman. Howdy, my name is Alex Mandanis, and I'm a sophomore electrical engineer. I'm Colin Sundin, and I'm a mechanical engineering junior. I'm Zane Akers, and I'm a general engineering freshman. Right, so a little bit about our product and the requirements that we need to achieve. Firstly, the product, we cannot assume that the product is either conductive or magnetic. So hey, it's flexible. And secondly, we have to vibrate the object, excite it, without touching it. Third, we have to be able to induce any frequency range between 10 hertz to 10,000 hertz. And thirdly, we know the shape of the object for this design statement, which is a cylinder of three centimeters in diameter and 20 centimeters in height. However, we can scale this up because the, design, the object size will be known beforehand. So hey, it's flexible times two. So going into the specifications of our specific model, we decided that our model would have 40 centimeter by length and a 6 centimeter diameter for the excitation device itself. And in our model, it is created through the prototype of a PVC, but the material of the cylinder itself can be adapted, as long as it is non-porous. We decided upon the 40 centimeter length and 6 centimeter diameter, knowing the sample size of the cylinder that we are testing. This, testing. Above, this, above the cylindrical model, we will have the vibrometer, which will be, which will be used to <coughs> measure our data. Now taking a look inside the cylinder, we have approximately six liters of ultrasonic gel, which is the same material used when um, having ultrasounds to detect fetuses within a womb. Then within the cylinder itself, there will be speakers attached, and this is what will be used to excite the sample. 
And we decided that the specific speakers that will be used are subwoofers and tweeters because those are the ones that will meet our requirements of the frequencies between 10 to 10,000 hertz. Simply to measure the sample and determine the material using the resonant frequency, the scientists will take their sample cylinder, attach it to the clamp, uh, which we can see, which is attached, to, which is mounted to this table, and simply release the claw, which will which will drop the cylinder, in, drop the sample cylinder into our base cylinder. Once the cylinder is fully submerged into the ultrasonic gel, a break beam will start the excitation, which is done through the speakers. You may be asking, why are we doing all this stuff? To determine a big reason. Um, to ensure safety, tiny micro, okay, in structures, tiny micro cracks can occur that are undetectable to the naked eye. These cracks can be seen, however, if you vibrate the object. Objects have resonant frequencies which are intrinsic to the material of the object. So if we find a very accurate way to vibrate the object, which is done through our product, then we can find whether or not there are micro cracks and whether or not structural, structural samples can be replaced. In the, in the case of nuclear reactors, we're not vibrating the entire structure. We're taking small components, putting them through our product, which we can adjust with size of the object, and we're resonating them. Why are we doing free fall? Free fall is a great method because it allows us to vibrate the object without having the vibration source touch the object. This will have some really accurate data. Next, why are we putting it in gel? Why not air or water? One advantage to the gel is that it slows down the fall so we can record measurements for a longer period of time. Another advantage of the gel is that the vibrations from the speakers travel through it very well, at least when compared to air and water. Next, will the vibrometer measure through this gel? The answer is yes. There is no uh, decrease in the measurement if we place a vibrometer above it. Additionally, with the, the purpose of the claw is that it releases, it the grip of the object all at the same time, so that when the object falls through the gel, it won't tip left or right, so the vibrometer will stay pointed on the same spot. Additionally, additionally, um, yeah. So next, the source of ex excitation, will it be enough to cover the ranges? Uh, the answer is yes. For the lower ranges, uh, speakers such as subwoofers and tweeters are, will produce the lower end, and for really high frequencies, ultrasonic probes are great for this. And they have enough energy and enough energy is preserved within the gel to make the vibrations in our sample measurable. Finally, why did we pick this shape? Well, actually, what's, what's unique about our product is that depending on the shape, you can structure the vessel to be any size or shape of the sample. Some of the stuff we were touching on earlier with uh, the not scalability is they hang samples with fishing line, and with large, heavy samples, this is awkward, and the fishing line can't support these sort of measurements. So we developed our method based off of techniques that were previously researched and we looked at those papers and came up with an innovative method that combines the best of what we could find and drops what was lacking. So for instance, suspending the sample with nylon strings as we mentioned earlier can lead to some complications in external vibrations. For one, if it's too large, then it can't hang and as well as when you're testing the sample hanging from nylon strings, you're not just testing the sample for its natural frequency, you're also getting the vibrations of the string. Additionally, contact methods where you use the excitation and say glue it directly to the source causes a similar problem. You're not just testing the sample, you're testing the transducer or whatever is exciting the sample and the sample itself. There are ways of doing non-contact methods such as electromagnetism, but that only works for conductive materials. For ours, we tried to expand past that so that it could work for multiple materials beyond magnetism, and it also has no suspension and no contact with the excitation. Okay, so some immediate and very important applications of our product is additive manu manufacturing, comparing metal 3D printed products to cast models. It's now have applications in biomedical, uh, comes immediately to mind with comparing a 3D printed limb to a cast metal limb and comparing how those will result 
uh, react to corrosive forces. And radiation effects, testing changes in a sample due to radiation. This is immediately about the containment walls that we talked about in the video. Those containment walls, the radiation results in damage and material. The sooner we can see um, damage happening to that material, the sooner we can fix it, and the less expensive and less impactful the overall damage will result. And finally, corrosion effects. Uh, this is a big problem right now, is determining how a sample will react, react to environmental corrosion especially if that is in a container for nuclear waste because they found that the radiation doesn't have necessarily a big effect on the container, but the environmental conditions do. Our product um, determines a very specific fingerprint. We can compare the pure sample to a sample that has been, say, for 10 years in these corrosive conditions, and we'll be able to see how, which material ages the best. So there you have it, ResTube. We'd like to thank Aggies Invent for hosting this opportunity, and we hope that we can do future research and improve this product with all of you. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. The resonators are up here. Now, judges, please, uh, any questions for this team? I, th I think I figured out how to turn this on now. Uh, so very uh, interesting, compelling project. Uh, what other applications uh, does this uh, technology also uh, in encompass? So in, in addition to additive manufacturing and ir irradiation, though. Um, so this, in, in very basic, our product is we can take a pure sample and compare it to a sample that has been slightly changed in some way according to its chemical nature or structural integrity. So we can use that for um, the structural, for wood or metal or anything that has been affected by corrosion or um, radiation or any other force and be able to see how much damage has already occurred and at a very, very small level. Great, thank you. Very good presentation skills, and it seems like you guys are uh, a, a team very early in your college career, so very, very good. Um, you present well. I would also say uh, a can of like gold spray paint goes a long way when you're presenting <laughs> something. So, I was <laughs> concerned about that, but this is art, so I would say this is part of the process. Okay, pre appreciate it. Thank you. I'll, I'll echo what Daniel said. Great presentation. And you're, you're all very early in your career, so I de definitely commend, commend you guys for that. Uh, I, I missed it in, in, the, in the intro, but are you targeting uh, nuclear materials as well or more support structures at these facilities? I would definitely say that our focus is one thing we specifically looked at was with these nuclear vessels, there are these containment walls made of concrete, and the upkeep of those structures is highly important in ensuring the safety of these systems, and so specifically focusing on that, that would be a great, this would be a great tool um, in terms of nu uh, nuclear power plant maintenance and safety of the surrounding communities, which is a huge concern as nuclear um, energy is being used more and more across the country and the world. Great, thank you, nice job. So I had one question, oh, is it on? Okay, had one question real quick on reproducibility. And so when you're dropping the targets, how reproducible is it and does that matter? So what we're touching on, uh, I think we saw in the video, is s sometimes when they'll do current methods of measuring resonance, they have to take a tiny sample and they have to mount it on the corners of these things. And so every time they mount it, it's slightly different. And so then you might be getting slightly different results. Whereas here, you just put it in a claw and then drop it and so it's really similar, if not the exact same, every single time. It reproduces exact, like, almost exactly the same. Related to taking the measurement, um, when you drop it, and it's therefore in free fall, how are you actually measuring the resonance? Are you doing it visually? Uh, uh, what's the mechanism for getting your data out? OK, so uh, we primarily have been we, we were given a generic vibrometer. We've been deciding that we're going to be using a, a laser Doppler vibrometer, which um, 
as the sample goes down through the liquid, uh, it's changing according to length. That's the first mode that we're judging. So that laser vibrometer is looking at the, the top of it and seeing as that distance changes. Um, and it's able to compensate for it falling. And as they, as a scientist wants to make it more precise, they can change the vibrometer's position. So it's looking at it from the side as it's twisting um, or in the, any other modes they want to see. We have time for one more question. So great presentation, thank you. Um, question about the vibrometer. Do you have an idea, or do you know what its sensitivity is and in relation to how you expect the energy from the source to couple you know, through the walls, through the fluid, into the thing? And I guess what um, distension you would expect from the target sample and, and the ability of the vibrometer to capture that. So basically, it, it's a question about the sensitivity of the vibrometer, because that would be kind of key to the whole thing, right? Yes. So uh, in terms of the vibrometer, it can. It, we were told that it senses the surf, the top of the the cylinder as it goes down, and that it, because of it's it's a laser, it can focus only a very specific surface area. So with the claw, we're having it release it very at a very precise time, so the cylinder doesn't bounce around as it hits the bottom. We're trying to get as close to falling straight down as possible. So laser Doppler vibrometer can just stare straight down the whole way and keep focused on the top of that cylinder. Awesome, thank you, nice job. Okay, the resonators, very well done. Take. <laughs> we're very, we're getting, uh, bearing down close to our break. So we have one more team before we let you guys go have a uh, a uh, 10 minute break, I imagine we'll do 10 minutes, uh, Rodney? Five minutes, so uh, we will want you right back. Uh, the next team lining up while the judges are finishing up, um, they're tallying. In fact, I have a couple more mentors over there, and I know we have some more. I would love for you guys to introduce yourselves, and yes, all of you. Um, we have a microphone right over here while the team is setting up. Hello, I'm Manny Garcia. I represent the Associate Direct Director for Weapons Engineering. It's a pleasure to be here. Can't thank Rodney and Shayla enough for holding this event. Uh, looking at the talent here, I want you to know I represent what's called the Strategic Staffing Office. And I'm impressed with all of these talks. So thank you for doing this. I want to thank, again, Rodney and Shayla, the professors, the LANO mentors, the LANO judges, and all of you for your hard work I've seen this weekend. Hello, I'm Vlad Hensel. I'm an R&D engineer in Safeguard Science and Technology Group in Los Alamos. And we basically, we design gizmos for the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency so that they can go and verify that other countries are not misusing nuclear material for illicit purposes. And this is a great opportunity to talk with a lot of to talk and work with a lot of young and talented people. So I'm really happy I had the opportunity to be here. Thank you. We got one over there and one over here. <laughs> Two more. Uh, hi, I'm Athena Sagadevan. I work in the same group as Vlad at LANL, uh, Safeguard Science and Technology. Uh, also a past Aggie, class of 2020, um, and glad to be back in Aggie land. Hello, I'm Jacob Mingir. I'm a materials engineer, and I'm also a past Aggie. And at LANL, I work on 3D printing and implementing 3D printing in new ways at LANL. All right, thank you. But remember, once an Aggie, always an Aggie. <laughs> Very good. OK, so we have, after this uh, great team presents, we will have a break. But let's give them our undivided attention. We're ready to go. Yes, we are. Ultrabots, take it. Hello, we are Ultrabot. We get it right every time. My name is Anthony Cicchini. Oh, sorry. My name is Anthony Cicchini, uh, and I am a sophomore nuclear engineer. My name is Jenna Hopper, and I am a junior in mechanical engineering. Hello, my name is Rafael Gomez, and I'm a freshman in uh, general engineering. Hi, my name is Ian Leibowitz, and I am a junior in mechanical engineering. We are going to start our presentation with our video. Hydraulics problems have popped up before on the DC-10. We have no 
hydraulic fluid, which means we have no elevator control, uh, almost none, and very little aileron control. I have serious doubts about making the airport. United Flight 232, however, just didn't quite make it. It crashed just before the runway and, in the words of one eyewitness, cartwheeled into hundreds of pieces. It suffered catastrophic failure of its tail-mounted engine and crashed in Sioux City, Iowa. The fan disc in the DC-10 was made from titanium that harbored a fatal hidden defect. A $21 million jet weighing 165 tons is brought down by a tiny metallic flaw. What situation out there? That disc was manufactured with a flaw. But a fatal hidden defect. As you saw in the video, uh, mechanical defects in a material can have ca catastrophic consequences when they fail. As you saw in the video, this, uh, this incident caused uh, 100 deaths, over 100 deaths, and $74 million in damages. A uh, part failure in this hydroelectric dam in Russia caused over 70 deaths and over $1.3 billion in damages. Right here in Texas, a uh, part failure in a gas turbine caused billions in damages and lost revenue. Thankfully, there were no lives lost in this incident. Non-destructive testing is critical at identifying part defects. A form of a form of non-destructive testing is ultrasonic testing, or UT. <laughs> um, however, there are limitations to, or there is limitations to the equipment used in non-destructive testing. As you can see from the graphic, uh, it's best for the sensor to be perpendicular to the part being scanned, to the surface of the part being scanned, to get the most accurate data. UltraBot combines commercial off-the-shelf technology, UT principles, and proprietary software into one automated package to perform UT tests. Now, maintaining this perpendicular orientation between a probe and a flat surface is easy enough. But once we introduce a complex geometry, it becomes time-consuming and difficult to scan. So. We have the problem that Ultrabot must solve. Mission critical parts have complex geometries that are difficult to scan. To solve this problem, Ultrabot will need to be modular. This will make it widely applicable and cost effective. Ultrabot will also need to perform a surface scan in under 10 minutes to save time and money. Due to the nature of the beam the angle and orientation of the probe must be within five degrees of that perpendicular orientation. And finally, to account for variable sizes in mission critical parts, Ultrabot will need to be scalable. From the very start of the design process, we looked at several ways in which we can attack this problem. Firstly, we looked at the formerly limiting system, the gantry, and we figured that although it would necessarily meet the design requirements, we figured that a robotic arm would not only be more widely accessible, but also reduce complexity and also elevate the amount of markets that we can hit because uh, it is widely dispersed between multiple industries. It is more applicable. And on the horizontal line of the matrix, we've also evaluated some different ways where we can actually scan the object first before we move the ultrasonic probe. We considered a pre-scan initially and we found that the pre-scan had already met the requirements for the problem. And having a simultaneous scan, um, another version that we could possibly address the problem with, 
uh, was in our mind overkill because it didn't justify the, the accuracy that it supplied did not uh, sufficiently justify the complexity it would introduce into the problem. So we decided to, um, I guess, coalesce into a robotic arm that would simply do a pre-scan and then commit to the sonic sensor. So UltraBot has uh, five major steps. And in the first step, we first want to map the object. So we start this by um, having the photo sensor on the robotic arm uh, stand still. And while the disk rotates, you have the object or the said material or part also rotate it. It does 360 degrees, and it would accurately model and convert uh, through photogametry a series of pictures into a workable model that we would then uh, output into part two. This is the fun part. This is where we actually start to trace the path with the model that was outputted from the previous step. In this way, we not only create a map by extracting these normal vectors uh, implicitly built into the model, uh, in, in, uh, yes, in, into the model, but at the same time, we're also converting that into uh, G-code, which is something that the robotic arm would be able to understand uh, based off of the point cloud as well as the um, normal vectors that we extract. So once we got the data, we got the path for the robot, we actually need to make the robot move and find what we want to do. We do this by sending the G-code to the robot. It'll be stored on the controller, and the controller will give the robot the actual electronical inputs to be able to move to the positions we want. But then we go to the actual step of collecting the data. What we care about in this is the ultrasonic data gathered by the probe that is supposed to be normal to the surface. The G-code we already have gives the machine instructions on where to move to keep the ultrasonic probe both oriented and scan the entire surface. While it's doing this, the ultrasonic testing equipment will be taking measurements at these different points along the surface of the part. Collecting this data will then, it will be aggregated for the ultrasonic data so then we can analyze the data and figure out the important parts. What are the deep possible defects in the part and where are they? This is a model of the system that UltraBot uses. As you can see, it has the robotic arm a motorized table to move the specimen around, the specimen itself, an ultrasonic probe that's interchangeable with industry standards, and a 3D scanner that is also industry standard off-the-shelf part. So you may be asking, this sounds like a really complicated problem. Can we do it? Of course we can. We have almost all of these parts already available. They're all off-the-shelf parts. First, we start with a 3D scanner. There are many different options for 3D scanners with different resolutions and accuracies. There's tons of robotic arms out there that are up to the task and provide plenty of resolution. And we have a motorized tables that will provide the resolution required. So all we need to do is put them together and make this automated system that will give us the UT tests on very complicated parts. Thank you. Thank we you. have been UltraBot, and we always get it right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ultrabots. <laughs> Judges, any questions for Ultrabots? Uh, very nice, very nice slides. Uh, your example there, a bit unsettling. I'm going to be on an airplane in about three, three hours. Uh, but but your video but your video looked like it was from the the 80s and so I assume there is currently something being done right now to catch those defects and so I'm just wondering what is the competing what are you competing with in the industry what are you going to be replacing? As of right now that we know of, there is no automated system as what we're we're suggesting. It might be in development, but as of right now, most of these scans are done by hand, and um, a lot of industries they think that the upfront cost is just too high. But we say that safety is more important, and so the upfront cost is worth it, either at the manufacturing or the maintenance stage, the life cycle, stage of the life, so life cycle. It, it feels like your application here is relevant today, but I feel like additive manufacturing would put you out of business. Can I ask how so? Uh, because you can effectively print it without the defects. Yeah, but also you're forgetting about the maintenance stage. So once that part goes into the life cycle, then it will uh, experience wear, and you need to be able to see if cracks are forming on the inside or if there's voids forming on the inside, stuff like that. It does have some nuclear applications because I know that as uh, 
metals are irradiated. Yeah, you get precipitates and stuff out of the metal. We haven't really looked into that much, but uh, I'm a nuclear engineer. I know a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so there's applications there as well. Thank you. Oh, oh, to add on to that, I would also say that in terms of additive manufacturing, in terms of all manufacturing, there can be flaws that are very almost undetectable by any other method except for UT scanning. And while we may assume parts are perfect, we need to test them before they go into service, and we have disasters like the Sioux City crash. Uh, great talk, wonderful work. Uh, I was just wondering if you looked at uh, possibly modifying an existing coordinate measuring machine, a CMM system, to allow you to do the ultrasonic measurements. Um, I know that's been done before, and I was wondering if you explored that space at all. So essentially what we're doing is pretty similar to a CMM, but we opted not to go with that because we want to be able to get very complex geometries in multiple planes and be able to get multiple sides at the same time, which a CMM can do in some cases, but the resolution of what we're looking for is not exactly that high as the CMM because we're looking for that plus or minus five degrees, so that would probably be overkill for this problem. Or uh, laser scanning CMM as well. That's yeah, so laser scanning is very similar to what we're already doing with the, we, but we decided to go with the photogrammetry sheet instead. As a technology Im uh, implementation, um, your, your test piece and a lot of the, the multi-dimensional pieces that I've seen around that would be critical components have gear teeth and other things and small fine features. How is the uh, technology of UT, is it small enough to be able to see into those cracks or those, those interfaces with the teeth, et cetera, of a gear? Yeah. So uh, UT, um, I know we on one of our slides we showed that uh, the scan was being done uh, on the surface. That is a, one way to do UT scanning, but most of, uh, a lot of times there's a, um, a, a standoff, okay? So you don't, you're not exactly limited by the, the width of the UT scanner head. Um, you have that standoff and the beam kind of focuses to a point or like a oval and uh, it can do a scan that way. So you can get more complex geometries like uh, gear teeth without a actually having to touch the part. Okay, we have time for one more question if the judges have. Nope, we are good. Okay, Ultrabot, thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. All right, everyone, we will be taking a five-minute break now. So go and take a break, stretch out, and uh, we will uh, join the live stream in five minutes.
Okay, so we welcome everyone back to Aggie's event, the 44th installation, perhaps maybe a little bit more, I'm not sure, where we are um, having our presentations uh, for the Los Alamos National Lab but need statements. Our students have been working all weekend. We have had six presentations already. They have been impressive, spectacular, unexpectedly so. Well, no, true Aggie fashion. I think they were expected. Uh, but now we have five more, and we are going to continue right now with our next team. You may come up here. Um, this is team Charlotte's Web. Howdy, my name is Dylan Frank. I'm a freshman pursuing nuclear engineering. Hello, I'm Robin Henriquez, a senior in aerospace engineering. Howdy, I'm Kshiti Kangovi. I'm a freshman pursuing mechanical engineering. Howdy, my name is Mohit Lele, and I'm a sophomore industrial systems engineer. Hi, my name is Lucia Malero, and I'm a freshman pursuing computer science. And hey, I'm Sean Wells. I'm a sophomore electrical engineer. And we are Charlotte's Web. Collisions. They're everywhere, but when left unchecked, can cause catastrophic damage. If you really want to protect something, then you need to catch it. A blast from a shockwave can release high levels of energy into the atmosphere, launching objects at dangerous speeds. Decelerating these objects is a task required to ensure the safety of the object and its environment. Introducing Charlotte's Web. Charlotte's Web is a catching mechanism which combines the most effective parts of various devices in order to maximize efficiency. A net is stretched across the projected path and connected to two rollers. A ratcheting mechanism prevents rebound and springs slow the object. The frame of the system is built with stainless steel. The net is weaved from a Kevlar composite. This combines high strength and elasticity. With a rolling behavior like blinds and a design built for reproducible results, we are Charlotte's Web. The problem that our team set out to solve is decelerating the test article safely to preserve sensitive instruments on board. So what is a blast tube? So researchers utilize blast tubes in order to study the variations in impulses that explosions create. So how does this work exactly? So a blast tube on one end uh, has a highly explosive material which when detonated spreads throughout the tube and when it reaches the end of the tube there is a projectile, a cone-shaped projectile that is launched due to the impulse. Essentially this blast tube creates a controlled environment where scientists can continue to produce, uh, gather data and to continually uh, repeat the process in order to study the variations of impulses. Ultimately, this test, uh, the blast tube is a effective and cost, uh, is an efficient and cost effective way to study blast impulses. Now, why do we want to catch our, text, our test article in the first place? Um, well, our test object often gets damaged on impact after it's hit by the blast of the blast tube. Um, this will ultimately damage all the uh, very important technology and instruments that are inside that are constantly gathering data on the different pressures and the type of damage that the blast tube will create on the article. Um, a safe and like a reliable safeguard will ensure the integrity of the projectile and it provides us with the ability to obtain reliable and reproducible data that will isolate the damage that is uh, created on the test object by the blast from the damage that is caused on impact. Before producing a design, we crafted five goals that we wanted our product to achieve. First is that less than 10% of the damage caused to the projectile should be done by the netting itself. 
the other 90% should come from the blast wave. Second is that our product should have reproducible results for about 95% of, of all tests. Third, our product should be able to withstand and dissipate 23 kilojoules of energy. This is the energy the projector will be coming in, into the net with. Fourth is that our product should be able to handle temperatures up to 300 degrees Celsius. This is the temperature that will be produced by the explosion. And finally, our product should be able to withstand pressures up to 500 PSI. This is the, this pressures come from the blast wave itself. Before finalizing our product, we first came up with three different designs. First is a fluidized bed of sand it, with air inside. When the projectile comes in and hits the bed, the sand will collapse in and of itself, catching it. Second design is a collapsible net. This net is on a horizontal wheels, and when the, when the projectile comes into it, it will collapse in and of itself, catching it. And finally, it's a spring-loaded net with a spring dampening system. So we went ahead and chose the third design, which is an uncoiling Kevlar net. Our Kevlar net is able to withstand pressures upwards of 320 megapascals, which means that no, which means that no projectile is going to tear it. Our Kevlar net can also withstand temperatures upwards of 500 degrees Celsius, which means the blast coming out of the the heat coming out of the blast tube will not damage it. So at the heart of our design is our spring dampening system. At the top of this mechanism, you can see our custom-made mainspring, which as the net uncoils, the, the spring coils up, creating a tension force that counteracts the momentum of the projectile. So below the mainspring, you can see our hydraulic dampener. This is really what makes our product stand out. To the experimenter's desire, he can control the positioning of the shims or the type of hydraulic oil within the container. And in order to prevent rebound, we have created a ratcheting system. As the, coil as the net unwinds, um, the ratcheting system will activate. And once the projectile has come to a complete stop, it'll stay at stop until the experimenter unlocks the ratchet. So here we have an example of our initial prototype. We launch a heavy object, such as a soda can, into our net, and as it is uh, being slowed down, the net unravels, and then it is caught into a pocket. Although we're dealing with blast tube uh, and catch devices in this case, um, Charlotte's web can be applied to a wide range of different fields, such as defense and military industries, as well as research that's being done in the automotive industry and aviation. So how does Charlotte's Web compare to products currently on the market? Charlotte's Web is unique in that its properties allow it to be extremely heat resistant of up to 300 degrees Celsius and 500 degrees Celsius with our Kevlar net. Second is that it can withstand a large amount of pressure. We want this we want our net to be really strong because with a projectile coming so fast, we don't want it to break. Because of these properties, Charlotte's Web is one of the most strongest things on the market. The only thing else that we found that's comparable to it are the nets that are used on aircraft carriers to stop aircraft and nets that catch UAV and other drones. After this, we conducted a market analysis and found that the total cost of one Charlotte's Web will be $34,380. First is zinc alloy steel poles. We chose zinc alloy steel poles because compared to normal steel, it's more temperature resistant and basically it's stronger. This will come out to $2,080 a unit. Next is a Kevlar mesh that can withstand a lot of pressure and it won't break easily, coming to $4,300 a unit. And the brunt of our cost will be from the springs and the hydraulic dampers, which are $8,000 and $20,000 respectively, which we'll be ending up manufacturing ourselves. Now, we also took a look at federal grant funding, and we found that the Department of Defense has given out money ranging from $5,000 to $225,000 in projects related to blast testing. So I believe with a case as strong as ours, we can get our projects fully funded. So the next steps for us, we need to establish a physical prototype for Charlotte's Web beyond just the proof of concept. This means we, got, we, we have to take our... Uh, we have to take the net, the Kevlar net, the uh, dampeners, and the steel frame, as well as the ratcheting system, 
and combine them into a finished product. We also are hoping to improve the design or not, not design. We're hoping to improve the individual components as well as the effic efficiency of the entire system. Once again, we are Charlotte's Web, and we'd like to thank you guys so much for your time, and we open the floor to questions. All right, Charlotte's Web. <laughs> Judges. Uh, so great talk. Uh, this is a challenging problem. Uh, you have a fireball hitting one of these test objects, uh, you know, exposing to a couple hundred Gs. So uh, tough problem, and at that cost, I'm sure we would buy 20 of those every year for the next 10 years. <laughs> Uh, just, just a basic question. What do you think the weak link is in your in your design? You know, where do you have the least amount of margin? I think that's going to be within the steel frames. Um, our steel frames have to be strong enough to one hold up the entire thing together, but it also has to be able to take all of the energy, the force of the impact, and still stay upright. Did uh, did you break any soda cans? Yes. <laughs> Uh, okay, so real, re real question here. Uh, so your name, Charlotte's Web, love it. Uh, what I'm seeing over here is uh, looks more a little bit like a like a blanket, and I'm just curious. Do you need a web? Maybe your Charlotte's blanket. So, <laughs> so we chose a blanket right now because that was unfortunately the only thing that was available to us. But we believe that a net would overall be more cost effective because if we had to make. Um, when using Kevlar, we would rather use a bunch of materials and make a net instead that's reinforced rather than have multiple sheets of Kevlar. So the main purpose of the net is along the blast wave to pass through it. That way we're not pushing the net back before the projectile even hits it. Thank you. Yeah. Nice talk. Um, I'll um, add to Donald's comment about the cost of the device. It's a nice. Uh, real world cost analysis, I think we could not possibly build that for anything less than 10 times that amount <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the real world. If you want to ch chat about the cost of things, the way it works at Los Alamos, ha I'd be happy to do that. Um, in any case, so the, um, I'm curious, so you used in two different units actually, the, the strength of the Kevlar for the, um, the net, and then one of the requirements was the kinetic energy of the projectile. How do those, how does that, how, how do you, know whether the strength of the Kevlar is sufficient for the kinetic energy that you impart to the projectile. So they're kind of, all the, all the necessary information is captured there, but I didn't see a link between them. Okay, so dissipating the kinetic energy comes from the spring. The spring is what's creating a counteracting force against the projectile. Um, the Kevlar is really for mainly like the end when the system comes to a stop. Um, we really like it because of its heat resistance and it's safe making sure that nothing's going to tear. But like I said, the majority of dampening comes from the spring. We really didn't have the specific coefficient of elasticity of the fabric itself that we will be using. So we ran a bunch of tests, like not actual tests, but like hypoth hypotheticals. Um, depending on the time of contact between uh, our test object itself and the like the net um, Kevlar has more than enough of the ability to like withstand the amount of pressure that 25 kilojoules of energy would uh, apply on that area on that surface area awesome thank you nice answers we have time for one more question Okay, thanks. Uh, great presentation, yeah, and it is a fun thing to see the challenging problem here. The only question I had is when you were going through your design concepts, you talked about three design concepts, so you quickly down-selected to this one. Um, I was just curious, what was the rationale you used for that down-select? So um, the second best idea would have been the fluidized bed, but there are a couple complexities with fluidizing a huge amount of sand. So it's kind of hard to gradually decrease the fluidization or kind of I guess buoyancy of the fluidized bed. So we figured we'd have a lot more control and our system would be a lot more predictable if we use like hydraulic dampeners and springs. Also to add on to that, something that is really nice about our product is it doesn't really require any electronics. Like all of the mechanical force and the, like the resistance that we're putting on the projectile comes entirely from mechanical components. 
So when we tried the fluidized bed idea, we depend kind of a lot on electronics, which tend to fail sometimes. Um, that's why we ultimately went with the web and with the net. In regards to the idea of a collapsible net, we were thinking of doing that, but then quickly realized that um, it kind of already exists, especially with those on aircraft carriers. And so we want to be a little bit more innovative, which is why we thought of um, a net that uses springs to counteract force and dampen the, um, the impact of our cone, and then a uh, ratcheting system to make sure that it doesn't rebound. All right, Charlotte's Web, well done. Thank you very much. Make sure you take your, very good, very good. Can I see that, ma'am, right there? Can you give me that? Thank you very much. All right, Charlotte's Web, great questions. Uh, very interesting to see uh, the interest of the judges to be here. These, uh, these have been presentations we've been working on all weekend. I have to say that it's not just the mentors uh, from Lanel and it's, uh, you know, it, and, and everybody else and Rodney Bame and myself. Um, there have been people here helping us all weekend that didn't have to be here. Don Bailey is one of them, uh, Professor Randy Brooks as well. And we have to give a big round of applause, folks, to Madeline and Stephanie, who actually have been running this whole thing and brought you food. So let's give them a big round of applause. We want to thank them and make sure that you do say thank you on your way back because I know these ladies have worked very, very hard. Okay, we are going to continue right away. Um, are we ready, judges? We're good. I'm getting the thumbs up. Very good. So this is Team Micro Trackers. All right. Howdy, everyone. My name is Justin Lee, and I'm a freshman in general engineering. My name is Mary Catherine Farrell, and I'm a sophomore in industrial distribution. My name is Josh Costco, and I am a junior in mechanical engineering. My name is Carlo Dicolito. I am a junior in nuclear engineering. My name is Manny. I'm a sophomore industrial engineering major. My name is Charles Danish, and I'm a sophomore nuclear engineering student. And we are the micro trackers. With millions of Texans struggling to keep warm, several power generators failed. It's now expected to be the largest insurance claim event in Texas history. We have been without power for 60 hours now. My family and I, we've been in the dark since Sunday night. Microreactors are the solution. Similar to traditional nuclear power plants, they use nuclear fission to generate electricity. Unlike their larger counterparts, microreactors are smaller, more cost effective, and can be factory made. They're also portable, meaning they can generate lots of electricity for remote communities, as well as communities that have been struck by natural disaster. But its portability presents unique security concerns. For example, what if this powerful nuclear device fell into the wrong hands? That's where MicroTracker comes in. A system to detect and deter potential invasions, ensuring that this can be a safe and effective form of energy. So that when a security threat does occur, you can rest easy knowing that MicroTrackers has your back. That's the MicroTracker difference. Okay, so as you can see from the video, microreactors propose unique security concerns, and that's mainly because of development of microreactors. So microreactors are developed on the basis that there can be little to no personnel on site as possible. And that's because microreactors will be deployed in remote communities that will provide heat and electricity. Now, due to the lack of supervision, it can lead to an increase in vulnerability to outside forces. Those outside forces could be rogue state actors and non-state actors. Now, as you can see on the screen, there is their motivation and capability. But the main points that I want to talk about are the targets that they're going to go for. Now, they will either externally destroy the microreactor, take the fuel pins inside the microreactor, or take the whole entire reactor itself. Now, with these three scenarios in mind, 
we were able to come up with five requirements that we wanted our solution to um, accomplish. The first of which is location tracking. We want to know where the reactor is at any given time. The second is impact detection. So if someone were to exert the force equivalent to a sledgehammer onto that microreactor, we would know and we would be alerted. Third is an independent power source. So the security system that we're making needs to have an independent power from the thing it's protecting, right? So this had to be our third requirement. Next is autonomous operation. So as Justin mentioned, one of the benefits of micro reactors are that they require limited supervision. What this means is that our system would need to have very little human intervention. Lastly, our fifth requirement was fuel removal detector. So just like we need to know where the actual micro reactor is, we also need to know if the fuel inside of it is taken or compromised. This led us to our three designs that we considered. First was deterrence. So this is reducing the likelihood that a threat would occur. Next is detection. When a threat does occur, how are we alerted or are we alerted? Lastly is response. What do we do when we are alerted through detection? We ultimately chose deterrence and detection to move forward with as we chose that this was the most in line with the scope of our project and our problem statement. Taking a look specifically at our detection system for the microreactor, we ended up with four mainstay features for detection. We're looking at two different features externally from the reactor, which is our independent power source and our location detection. As mentioned, by, as mentioned earlier, those will cover some of our requirements. We have one in line with the fuel pins, which is our fuel removal detection system which will be able to see when people are tampering with the fuel rods. And we also have one feature, which is our impact detection system, which will be inlaid inside of the steel casing of the reactor, but outside of the containment drums, so that people will not be shocked when trying to maintain the reactor. In order to increase the system reliability, we decided to focus our individual components on proven and conventional systems, but by integrating these individual components into a comprehensive security design, we can create an innovative system. So as we all know with traditional nuclear reactors, they have physical barriers as well as an electronic monitoring system for security. We utilize the same methodology with the micro reactors. Think about it from the perspective of a potential intruder. They see a large electric fence bright LEDs, a warning nuclear symbol, and a surveillance system. They would obviously have second thoughts about carrying through. But let's say that they were actually bold enough to actually steal the device itself. We have two incredibly small location tracking devices, smaller than even the tip of the pencil, that are able to track it within a five meter radius anywhere in the world. Our system is going to use data from multiple sensors to determine the viability of our reactor and the safety of the fuel. To detect breaches, we are going to add a fiber optic cable based seal around the reactor. It's going to be inside the containment but outside of the core. So if you wanted to get to the core and get at the fuel, you need to break this cable and that would interrupt the flow of light and that would set off our alarm. We also want to monitor the status of our fuel. So we are going to use equipment already in the reactor to monitor the power output, and we are going to add an array of fiber optic sensors to create a, <coughs> sorry, a spatial temperature profile of inside the reactor. If the reported values for either of these are more than 0.5% different than the expected values, then the alarm will go off. The main purpose of the system is to let us know when someone is either forcibly trying to take the fuel or they're secretly trying to tamper with it. Our impact detection system is going to use an accelerometer, a microphone, and a vibrometer. If an acceleration of over 30 Gs is detected, the microphone data will be evaluated and analyzed to look for sounds consistent with stainless steel impacts, and we will also look for unusual vibration. Once one of these secondary conditions has been met, <coughs> then the alarm will go off. 
The fifth and final feature of our detection system is its independent power source. We would like, in the event of a loss of power accident or an event of an unauthorized depowering of the reactor, that the security system be online for up to three days to provide accurate last location data and surveillance data and everything that has to do with security. It should last up to three days because we've determined that that's the threshold for when our detection team should be able to respond to a, to a threat. Now, you may be wondering to yourself, how is this all going to work in the real world? But you'd be in luck because we're, we have put together a demonstration to show a couple of the features. The following is a demonstration of a tracker security system. This object represents a scaled version of a nuclear microreactor. One feature of the micro tracker security system is its detection of containment breaches seen here as a coiled wire. Notice that the alarm light begins to glow when containment is breached. Next, we will demonstrate the microtracker security system's impact detection feature. When the reactor is jostled too much, the alarm begins to sound. Not included in this demonstration are the microtracker security system's position tracking, fuel removal detection, and auxiliary power features. In order to properly Im implement this, there are a few gaps we have to fill in. First of all, we have to define what a timely detection is. We also have to look at our alert frequency to determine the false alarm rate. And using these two metrics, we can have a clear communication strategy for local authorities who can handle response. While macro reactors have the opportunity to revolutionize our power grid, they also have unique security concerns. Thankfully, our system incorporates a revolutionary design to respond to each of these concerns. If the reactor is moved, We'll know. If someone tries to break into the reactor, we'll know. And if someone tries to attack it from the outside, we will know. Because no matter how stealthy, no matter how small, micro trackers track it all. Thank you. Uh, any questions? All right, micro trackers. There we go. Very good. We have five minutes for our judges' questions. Go for it. Sounds like you have a really good application for the degenerators, too. Uh, as far as uh, power support source. Um, I really like the concept that you have here of multivalent or, or, or depth uh, here. Um, have you looked at other backups? So just say your battery dies and you don't have your three, uh, three days or uh, maybe for general power, maybe you're taking the waste heat from the reactor itself and converting it through electronics into a power source in and of itself, where you're not tied into the electronics of the, of the system, uh, but you're still getting a, a leach of power, or et cetera, with an emergency backup if that is turned off. Sure. Yeah, I think Carlo can answer this question. So some of our features are actually mostly passive. This includes our fiber optic array inside the reactor core, which gives us a spatial readout of the reactor. That will tell us if a certain amount of fuel pins are taken, that will tell us exactly where. And we'll be able to uh, detect that by seeing a temperature gradient that's abnormal. Um, and that is one of our main features for the removal of the detector system. Also, our fiber optic seal, which uh, detects if there is a break in the reactor pressure vessel, is also passive. So these two features are not dependent on an external power source. So even if our battery dies, we will still be able to monitor these systems. Additionally, if we stop receiving feedback entirely from the reactor, we will be notified, and we can alert the local authorities to check it out. Really nice job. Thank you. Um, quick question. You may have said it, and I'm sorry if I missed it. Uh, how is that it, any of this information communicated to you or to the outside world from the reactor? Sure, I can answer that. So there are a couple of location systems, which would include global positioning. Let me try and... So we've got, we've got location detection as part of the mainstays for the detection. So that'll already have some SATCOM capabilities. So it'll be wirelessly transmitted to a satellite, a satellite communication network. Um, we did evaluate in our threat model Obviously, in, if there's rogue, rogue state actors, they might have some, some cyber, cyber security capabilities. They might be able to take that, SATCOM, sat, uh, that, that satellite system down. So we were kind of trying to find a way to get wired detection as well. But currently, we're looking at SATCOM. So that global positioning tracker is going to be connected to, connected to uh, a wireless system. Great. Thank you. Yep. Go ahead. 
Sure. See, Justin, I think Justin can answer this one. All right. Unfortunately, we did not consider that. We were mainly focused on how we could um, protect the overall reactor. But I feel like in our future phases, we will try to accommodate for the lack of um, accessibility to um, remote regions, like you said. Right. So, nice job. You guys did a really good uh, presentation. Um, I have a question regarding the longevity of the sensor suite, uh, especially in the radiation environments. Did you consider that? Is there going to be a, maybe a, a certain cadence of swapping out your instruments over the lifetime? Sure. Yes, sir. We did actually consider that uh, in our layout. We figured that the through removal detection systems, a lot of that would be based off of power output, which is telemetry that's already measured within these microreactors. So that would be consistent with sensor replacement for normal operation of the reactor. For external systems like the independent power source and the location detection systems, we want to have them external to the entire reactor system, connected regardless, but, but, but separate due to the fact that it is a high radiation environment and it, it will soil a lot of that, specifically for the battery, I will say, because it could definitely shorten the shelf life and it's like if you have a loss of power accident and you've kept your battery next to the reactor the whole time and your battery is, is a no-go, then you're out of luck. So we've, we've taken some of that into consideration. We haven't, we haven't sat down and figured out, OK, we want the battery in a lead box. We want the GPS to be on top of the, the semi-truck where the micro reactor is in. But we definitely put some, some thought into it. All right. Uh, sadly, that is the time we have for Q&A from the judges. Micro reactors, let's give them a round of applause. Good job. <laughs> Very good. Um, what you are watching here is these are teams that are comprised of multidisciplinary students, so they are from all schools of engineering, and they're also multi-level. So from freshmen to PhD students have come together, focused their attention over the weekend on one um, issue, one need statement, one problem statement. In this particular weekend, we have been looking at nuclear security, which is something that we all are very interested in. Um, I know the judges are looking at the scores for the, for the last team right now. We, sorry that you, we run out of time for your question. Next time you gotta go a little quicker. I have to say that I know for sure, because I've just gotten some texts from um, some of our students that are all over the nation that just heard that Aggie's event was going on and they're watching live stream, this live stream. So thanks for joining us. Um, they have uh, participated before and they really know the value of this event. So with that, I will leave you with fog or FOG? Fog. We're going with fog. Howdy, my name is Jack Lee and I'm a freshman general engineer. Howdy, my name is Henry Charter and I'm a junior nuclear engineer. Howdy, my name is Jack Reed and I'm a junior nuclear engineer. Howdy, my name is Jorge Castaño and I'm a junior electrical engineer. Howdy, my name is Austin Caruso and I'm an electrical engineering graduate student. Howdy, I am Joss Buya, I am a junior mechanical engineer and we are fallout gentlemen, fog and our device is RAMAR, radio, Radioactive Material Augmented Reality Detection. What's one thing everyone fears? Terrorism? Loss of loved ones? Nuclear war? What about this? Radiation, the nasty byproduct of atoms decaying away. Not only does it pose as a significant health risk to anyone exposed, but it is invisible to the human eye. Therefore, it is imperative for human safety to always be aware of the presence of radiation, especially when it handling radioactive materials. However, one might not always know where a source of radiation originates from. What do you do then? This is where Raymar comes in. Raymar unites the power of top-of-the-line radiation detectors and 3D AR visualization 
to alert a user what direction radiation is coming from. The RAMAR will detect incoming neutron or gamma radiation and calculate the direction from which it originates all the while keeping the user at a safe distance. RAMAR can be used in labs, hospitals, and weapons decommissioning and to keep technicians healthy and happy. RAMAR by FOG So, I'd like you all to draw your attention to the blue bars in this graph. And the fact that by 2024, radiation detection is projected to be a $35 billion business. This graph right here, this is the Google searches for guard counter from May 2022 to October 2022. As you can see, this month it has skyrocketed. People are interested in this. So, what is the demand? Why is there so much demand for radiation detection? Well, we know two things about radiation. It's invisible and it's harmful. We need to detect it, but our current, de our current detection technology, we can't see it with a guider counter, and the average Joe can't use it. So what we want to do, we want to create a device that can visualize radiation in an intuitive manner that anybody can use. So we decided that our solution to this problem must meet five main requirements. Number one, it must fall under a budget of $5,000. Uh, it must be able to visualize radiation in a similar manner a heat map would. Uh, it must have a five foot radius of detection. It must have half a second of latency period between data collection and visualization, so operating really close to real time. And it must weigh less than 10 pounds so that it does not become uh, overbearing on the user. So we came up with three primary designs. The first one is something similar to a VR headset where the detectors are built into a hat of some sort or goggles and that they would look around and radiation would automatically come up on their feed. A second uh, design we considered was using a robot. Uh, we thought about mounting several camera, um, radiation cameras and detectors on it and using that to display footage. And we also thought about of a radiation detection selfie stick. Um, of the three designs, we decided to go with the VR headset slash helmet design. And we decided to do this because the helmet design is very basic. There is a uh, way less moving parts than a wand or a robot. Uh, the radiation is detected in the line of vision, and that's very important if you're wanting to navigate a questionable region. Uh, it detects radiation in a live feed. It's w uh, way better to see if it's in front of you uh, than if it's held up in your hand. And then it also frees up your hands. And this is the prototype uh, which we designed you notice that there's nothing that you need to hold in your hand, so you can bring along extra equipment if you so desire. Yeah, so um, our uh, pro uh, solution is uh, innovating in uh, today's nuclear game. Um, when we did initial research on this, we found two uh, projects, one from Sandia National Lab and another one from UC Berkeley. Um, and at Sandia, uh, they did VR imaging of radiation data. And at UC Berkeley, the location of my bad uh, location of radiation source using a planar sensor data. Um, we want our application to be of a mobile. Um, you want to walk around the lab and see, you know, uh, radiation, gamma and neutron radiation around the lab. You know, in my personal experience, I went to work on Friday and we did a radiation survey, and it took two hours to cover you know, 80 square feet, and like, if you could do that in, you know, VR or augmented reality, it would definitely ease that up. Um, so materials, uh, we decided to go with four Geiger-Muller detectors. Uh, these detect gamma, beta um, only. Um, these are about $160 in total. They use a Geiger-Muller tube and Arduino microcontroller. Um, and then the rest is a helmet display and apparatus. Uh, this costs about $1,200. And then um, microstructured neutron detectors. Uh, this costs about $2,000 in total uh, for a total of about $3,500. Um, and then essentially, uh, you have a detector. You read uh, radiation data. Uh, the position of that radiation data reading and that reading sends, is sent to a computer. That computer um, then maps that um, to like an origin, and then that shows up in your HUD. This here is a prototype that you may have seen in the video. On this prototype, we have five sensors total. We have a prototype um, with side sensors uh, here, and then we also have uh, three triangular 
uh, configured sensors on the top in which we will initiate visualization with this. The total materials used for this visualization add up to about $50, not including the visualization, which is what I will int uh, have introduced next. We implemented the augmented reality visualization proof of concept using a calibrated camera and MATLAB's computer vision and image processing toolbox. Unfortunately, they wouldn't let us play with actual gamma and neutron radiation, so we used April tags to define the world coordinates, and we were able to successfully place a simple cubic structure in a video that was recorded. Ideally, the, visu the visualization through the heads-up display would look like what's on the left with a 3D point cloud representing density of the radioactive point source and uh, relative to the one over R squared uh, relationship in intensity and in radiation. Our device is a one of a kind technology. How would you like to see the radiation next to you in the room? Well, actually maybe you wouldn't, but the energy industry, laboratories, and law enforcement probably would. Our, in the en energy industry, our device makes detecting potential uh, radiation leaks and decommissioning nuclear power plants much more efficient. In laboratories, it is critical to train researchers and employees to know where and how intense radiation is in the, in the job site. Our device makes that much more simple and easy. In 2019, the International Atomic Energy Agency received 190 notifications of nuclear material being unaccounted for, lost, or stolen. This is pretty dangerous. It's just 2019. Our device would help uh, manage and prevent these orphaned sources and the proper disposal of them. In conclusion, we have shown to you that we have met the five requirements of which we set out to achieve. It was under budget of about $1,500, and we believe we have high confidence that the solution we have brought forth is feasible in the real world. Um, it has a variety of applications in the medical field, the military field, and uh, in the lab setting as well. It helps us visualize radiation, keeping people safe. As my professor once said in class, if he were to smuggle radioactive material through the border, he said he would surgically put it in cows. So together, we could stop my professor from bringing radioactive cows into the USA. Thank you, and giga. Any questions? All right. <laughs> All right, judges, any questions about radioactive cows? Let's go. Can I go first? I got the mic first this time. <laughs> I, I, I think your idea is really uh, compelling. I love the augmented reality idea. It's like almost making a, uh, it sounds like ghost detection, right? Something that's invisible, you can, you can now see it. I guess my biggest concern in your requirements is 10 pounds. That sounds so heavy for something you're gonna wear on your head. How did you come up with the 10 pound requirement? Uh, this was a requirement given, uh, given to us by the needs statement, uh, but our product would be probably less than five pounds. Uh, because the detectors are very small, lightweight, and any of the other materials you guys want to. Thank you. All right, two questions. Third time's a charm. Um, are you doing your, your VR uh, t linkage? and real timing on the helmet? Or are you beaming it to a computer that's nearby and then it's beaming back? Uh, that's what we would do. The proof of, uh, the proof of concept um, was just a pre-recorded video that placed it in. Uh, we didn't have actual radi radiation data to coordinate, to uh, calculate coordinate uh, directions. So if we did, we would have uh, 
a Bluetooth uh, connection to the computer to do that processing. And the, the final product would actually have an onboard processor that's capable of doing all of that. Uh, so the following question, and uh, this goes to applicability. Um, a lot of work and workers within a nuclear facility or a nuclear environment, decommissioning, et cetera, um, safety is paramount, right? So this is a great topic, great uh, solution, great opportunity, but there are trade-offs in every case, right? So I, I applaud you for putting it in a hat for, you know, construction or demolition. You know, it could be part of the safety equipment that they wear, but have you looked at what the potential trade-off of um, the augmented reality and what they're seeing versus what they need to be seeing to be safe in the actual evolution of the work? There, there is the plan to implement a dial that they could turn that uh, slides up and down the opacity of the heads-up display. So uh, when they need to be more aware of the physical surroundings, they can dial that down and you know make sure they're not tripping over anything and it wouldn't obstruct their vision. If I could uh, interject in just a second. Um, we do have a, uh, a future uh, work after all our all of our references um, so where do we go from here uh, be able to project uh, visualizations in a transparent visor uh, design and implement uh, solutions to power the Raymar um, we know that you know these uh, detectors take a lot of uh, energy to you know, actually detect so we we're thinking about a battery backpack and then different approaches to mobility and 3d overlay like your question was saying um, backpacks, vests for protection, gloves for protection, tripod for, um, you know, uh, having an origin as a reference. So, you know, I believe we did all this in 48 hours. You know, imagine doing this in 48 days, what we can accomplish. Um, so, yes, sir. Uh, great job and great product. Uh, quick question. In your design requirements, I think it said the standoff distance should be five feet. Now, to me, that seems awfully close. So why... Why, why is that? Um, could it be a further standoff distance? I think what you showed in the lobby here was quite a bit further than five, five feet. Yeah, uh, five feet would be the ideal. Uh, it's at least the minimum boundary of which we hope to detect. I mean, as the, dis as the further you get away from radiation, the intensity uh, decreases by uh, one over R squared. So I, ideally, uh, five feet would be the minimum. Hopefully, we can expand that more to seven or even 10 feet to really help minimize the amount of radiation the user is absorbing. So, All right. Yeah, th that thank you. And what you said about um, uh, being achievable in 48 days, I do think it's, it seems to be an achievable product. Mm -hmm. Very thank good. You. That is the time we have. Fog, very well done. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. For um, as we go, let's see, I got to cheat and make sure that I know who's coming up next. Oh, yes, I do. Uh, again, uh, quite impressive to watch these teams uh, deliver these presentations that they have been indeed only had, uh, you know, 48 hours uh, to work on. They've come a long way. I love what I just heard. Imagine what we can do with 48 days. That's amazing. But you don't get 48 days. You just get two and a half. Um, very good. So now we have the next to last team, uh, the Carnival, I believe. There you go. All right. All right. So howdy and welcome to Aggieland this afternoon. We are the Carnival and the main question we have for you today is, are you ready? And we'll get more into what the, about what that means in a second after we introduce ourselves. So my name is Tier Pet. I am a senior and I'm studying nuclear engineering. Howdy. I'm Abhishek Srivasto. I'm a graduate student and pursuing masters in industrial engineering. Howdy, I'm Lewis Walter, and I'm a senior in electrical engineering. Oh, 
ground area. The first time ever in level flight. All right, so are you ready? Ready for what? How does this affect you? How does this affect us all? And how does it affect us here now and today? So from our first steps and our first sparks of flame to our first steps in the moon, throughout the history of human spaceflight, there's always been challenges to overcome and problems to endure. Nowadays, these problems are pushing us further and further, faster and higher. And we need to figure out how to overcome these challenges and how to prevent problems of the past from happening again. So one of the things that we have here today is that we need to create a test bed that will uh, test these you know, hypothetical vehicles of the future, these hypervelocity projectiles, flight vehicles, spacecraft. And th these vehicles have very challenging regimes they need to be able to endure. Reentry, uh, takeoff, uh, high speed, high G maneuvers in the atmosphere. So we need to collect data and be able to analyze these failure modes and how this affects these craft as we try to push these next steps and push this envelope of human spaceflight. So our goal of the Carnival system is to create a sort of advanced centrifuge model that is able to look at, for example, we have a centrifuge, we're speeding it up to high Gs, high G loads, 200 Gs, like a normal centrifuge. But then the next step is what if we can rotate this model as it's spinning? We can change the direction of the acceleration vector and collect very continuous data about different orientations and how the model will react at various orientations and g-loads while it's maneuvering. So looking at an immediate problem here, uh, how, does, how is this immediately accessible and useful to people, right? There's this company right now called SpinLotch that's looking at a really interesting idea of just spinning a, 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 a launch vehicle, a satellite, some sort of aircraft, spacecraft, spinning it really fast and just letting it go, like a ball in a tether, shooting it off into space. It's a little bit novel, but the idea is, is sound and they're working on it. They're trying to develop a model. And so those engineers, I bet, are very curious about not just the stress of this model as it's accelerating radially, those forces are pushing outwards on it, but also as it leaves the tube, right? As soon as it leaves the tube, you have that acceleration is going radial straight to backwards as now it's accelerating in the air as it's going up into space. So you have this, and you'll see in our problem requirements, this very discrete change from zero degrees to 90 degrees. But what's going to happen is you have to model that. And if you're taking a normal centrifuge, right, you're going to put it in once like this, once like this, once like this. That's a nightmare, and that takes forever. So if you can sh rotate that model while it's spinning, be able to collect that data, create a nice continuous plot, and be able to test that without all the nightmare and headache of we've got to take it out, we've got to put it back in, we've got to rotate it, what if it breaks? All those elements that introduces Murphy's Law into your project and pushes it back in every few weeks, in every few months. So now my colleague is going to talk about some of the technical aspects of the system we've created and how we can implement it and get it out there to be use to help us push these boundaries. Yeah. Before going to the actual mechanism, uh, we'll, uh, we'll look after some of the key parameters. One of the main constraint is the weight. The weight we have selected around 100 kgs. Uh, and the factor of safety here we have is uh, 2. So it, it can go up to 200 kgs. And the volume should be around 1 meter cube. And, uh, uh, as he explained very well that our object should rotate while it is rotating. So the direction or the angle that we have decided is between 0 to 90 degree or uh, one of the most important key constraint is the g-force. So 200 g-force is the constraint that we have taken and uh, just to uh, give an idea about how 200 g-force look uh, will look like, I want to ask a question. Imagine that an astronaut uh, is, in a, is they are traveling to a space. So how much G-force they experience? Anyone has any idea about that? Hmm? Just a three to five G-force. So imagine that the rocket is traveling at a speed of 10,000 miles per hour. 
more than supersonic speed and they are experiencing only 3G to 5G. So you can very well lar uh, uh, large the scale and you can understand uh, uh, how 200G force will look like. So to uh, now we'll see about the mechanism. So uh, the overall mechanism built in four stages. So first we need to hold our uh, object so that while rotating it should not, uh, due to centrifugal pull, it, it should not leave the environment. The second, uh, we have a belt and pulley mechanism. We want to rotate the object. But the reason why we have selected that if we have a belt and our object is over the belt, we have uh, overcome the limitation of the angle of rotation. With the belt, it can rotate in 360, uh, 360 direction. Then uh, we have controllers as well to rotate that, that we will talk about later on. And uh, to run that, yeah, so the actually the axis of the uh, rotation of the body should be parallel to the axis of the main shaft. So we'll look after the mechanism. So here is the main shaft, the bigger one, cylinder. We have two up arms, upper arm and lower arm, or lower arm, and belt and pulley mechanism. And fixture is nothing but our object. So here is a uh, simple mathematical equation for centripetal force. Uh, here we have taken the radius as 9 meter. The reason why we have taken this 9 meter because NASA already has a centrifuge which has a radius of 9 meter. So we, we, we have tried something that we, whether we can install our mechanism into their existing mechanism by modifying that or not. So we came that the radius or the angular velocity required is 140 RPM which is very well ex uh, achievable. So here is the controller. I ask my colleague to explain about that. Yeah. The idea, the, the centrifugal machine has two motors. The one in the base rotate the cylinder, and the one sitting in the cylinder that's driving the belt that's turning the fixture. The one on the base motor is controlled like any other centrifugal from a console, easy to wire because it's not moving. The circuit that's inside the cylinder needs to be pre-programmed or programmed after every motion to be or programmed before you run an experiment because because since you know what you have to do it can just take the motor and go through the motions of spinning the machine when it needs to and going back down in this way just simple easy going the Adreno machine sends a signal to the switch a simple BJT model in this case, sending this thing to the DC mode to turn on or off. And in future iterations, this would be more complicated, more, more ways to control how fast, how slow, what, when it stops, when it goes. Just overall more control. This is just a basic design. And for our prototype, that's on the next slide, it is just a flip switch on the top of spinning the so, uh, spinning the module. And so today we actually have the model over there. If you'd like to look at it after the presentations, mess around with it. It's a physical model. fully represents both spinning on both axes. As you can see, the belt in the middle is spinning. And this kind of demonstrates one of the ideas of using a belt because issues with rotation, right, at 200 Gs, you want that belt system to be counterweighted. So if a belt, whatever goes out, comes back in. So it reduces that kind of need to counterweight that belt. And you can just spin it either way with very little torque requirement because it's just constantly going back and forth, in and out, conservation momentum. And this essentially is our mechanism as we have presented it in a, uh, a test model. And we just uh, like to thank you for your time today. And if you'd like to come with us on this journey, thank you for your time. All right, the carnival. <laughs> Judges, you will now have five minutes for any questions of this team. Okay, <laughs> nice work uh, for such a small small group. Um, looking at your design, it looks like it's spinning on the wrong, wrong axis. Did, did you guys m miss the requirement? Uh, could you clarify the question, sir? Uh, it looks like y from your design, it, your, your um, re-entry body would be spinning on the wrong axis. And I was just wondering if you could, is there any way flexibility in design to change it so that your arms are faced this way, it's spinning in this direction, along with your deceleration 
uh, direction. Yes, sir. So the main uh, deal of this centrifuge is the acceleration is always going to be uh, in the radial direction away from the center. So being able to rotate that body, you have uh, the ability to change that essentially in a 360 manner around any direction. So if you place your model there and rotate it, you can change that vector and kind of get that data of if it's accelerating this way, if it's accelerating this way, left to right, front to back, but it is only in, in two directions. You need to mount it, just flip the model up, and then now you have the ever, you know, body of rotation. Okay. Any other questions from the judges? biology teacher would be cringing right now looking at what happened to that centrifuge but it's it's a very effective uh, prototype and demonstration and I congratulate you on that thank you all right the judges have been so impressed impressed into silence thank you the carnival let's give them a round of applause thank you, for the thank you everyone Okay, we are down to our last team of the afternoon. After this team finishes and we ask questions, we will, um, you know, have, have the students, every team, please, we, we will go out by the stairs, the steps over there in front of uh, uh, Starbucks. And back here, we have, just go ahead and go like this. She's going to be taking pictures of the team, so everybody, once they finish, just go out into the lobby and, and let the judges then have their discussion as to, you know, their deliberation. Okay? So we are on to the last team of, the, of this Aggies event, Nuclear Security, sponsored by Lano. And please welcome <laughs> High Power. Howdy, my name is Chase Charlton and I'm a senior in chemical engineering. Howdy, my name is Julia Jang and I'm a sophomore in mechanical engineering. Howdy, my name is Micah Matthew and I'm a sophomore aerospace engineer. Howdy, my name is Madison Reuter and I am a junior nuclear engineer. Howdy, my name is Courtney Schlosser and I'm a senior in biomedical engineering. Howdy, my name is Quang Trung, I'm a junior in electrical engineering. Nice to meet you all. February 14th, 2021, a day many Texans know all too well. Millions were plunged into freezing cold and darkness. Blanketed with snow and glazed with ice, homes in Texas are burning. 246 dead. This never has to happen again. Fuel cells are the solution, but they've had a historically low operation time until today. We are improving modern fuel cell technology to make it more reliable than ever before. These fuel cells are compact forms of green energy that could revolutionize crises, running for days at a time. Current alternatives require an external energy source to maintain efficiency, but our solution is entirely hands off. With their use, we would never have to face the tragedy brought ever again. When problems arise, so do we. All right, so we are high power and we believe that hydrogen fuel cells are the future of helping crises, actually. And we believe that hydrogen fuel cells can further the existence of energy and help crises. But there's one major problem with hydrogen fuel cells. Water buildup stops fuel cell operation. Why does it do that? Well, within a hydrogen fuel cell, it harnesses the energy created through the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen which yields both a minimal amount of heat and good amount of energy. But a byproduct of this reaction is water. And all it takes is the equivalent of one raindrop worth of water to be produced inside of this fuel cell for the entire operation to stop. 
if this production was to be expanded for a day, then this fuel cell would create the equivalent of 16 ray drops inside of itself. That's what we need to fix. So we needed to design a passive water removal system from a closed fuel cell. Why can it not be active? Well, in certain critical applications, no watt can be spared. So our product had five requirements. It first had to allow the fuel cell to produce five watts consistently for a minimum of 24 hours. The reactants regulated must be at a constant pressure of 150 PSI. There must be no active components. And the system must be completely passive after initial activation. And there must not be a negative impact on performance. We looked at three different ways to approach this problem. The first being a pressure differential between the fuel cell and the water exit system. The second being capillary action, where we would insert tubes into the fuel cell to remove that water into the fuel exit system. And the third being magnetization, where we would introduce a impurity in the water in order to make it slightly magnetized and then use magnets to extract the water in that sense. And we decided upon using capillary action. So capillary action isn't something new. We all know how it works, right? Whenever adhesion force on, uh, from the water molecules to the wall to fibrous material is greater than a cohesion force between water molecules, capillary action happens. What is great about this is it actually works without any external forces, which is amazing for a closed fuel cell system. We ran two experiments to test our hypothesis. We just filled up the tray with water in which two different mediums, cotton and hemp, we ran uh, into the fuel cell, which is our tray, and leading outside into the system. What well, we found from this experiment that water does indeed move up onto the hemp or the medium and leave the system, which can be demonstrated by our uh, picture. The problem with this was that the rate was super slow. That is dependent on our medium. From further investigation, we find that carbon nanotubes is actually the perfect material to use to remove water. They have high porosity. It can move a large amount of water quickly to allow a few cells to continuously uh, be active. Essentially, we will twist, twist carbon fiber into thin strings and place them along cathodes and anodes of the gas diffusion layer on the fuel cell. And water, which forms in those layers, will be absorbed into the ropes and get transported out of the system. We needed to make sure that the flow, weight, flow rate of water being produced by the system would be able to be moved out of the system. We chose carbon nanotubes because they have a relatively high porosity of 0 0.9, as well as acting as facilitators of capillary action. We determined that we would need 960 million nanotubes total per fuel cell to remove all of the water that was produced so there would be no accumulation in the cell. There's already a commercially available material for this that we could use, and we would need 56 tape film rolls to implement this, and that would cost $8,400. Right now, the fuel cell without the carbon nanotubes will only last for two hours, but if we add the carbon nanotubes, it'll last 12 times that amount. Our system of choosing carbon nanotubes is optimal because the carbon nanotubes are composed of a material that already exists in the material. There is going to be no loss to our fuel cell performance because it is a passive system and is better than the traditional active approach because it doesn't require extra energy to forcibly extract water from the system. It is going to consistently remove water and it ensures that the fuel cell performance runs longer. Our system is efficient. It's lightweight, it's scalable, it's compactable, and it's small. We have a picture of a fuel cell next to an AirPod case just to show its size. And it has a relatively high power density for its size. It's very durable and it lasts 10 times longer than the conventional battery.
Best of all, it has no gaseous emissions. It only produces water and a bit of thermal energy. So where can these fuel cells be used? It's actually currently being used in many different industries, such as the space program and aviation due to its compact size and lightweight. So when mass and volume calculations are really important to operations, um, the fuel cell is a very optimal option. And things like the defense industry or unmanned aerial vehicles, things like that. And because it's a green form of energy where the only byproduct that we've already taken care of is water, um, then things like space exploration or deep sea exploration, this product would help immensely. There's also many further options that our product would help facilitate because of the longer efficiency, the longer duration of power uh, efficiency. Thank you. Do you have any questions? All right. High power. That was high power. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Judges, you have five minutes to ask questions. Very, very unique and a very good uh, choice of materials on carbon nan nanotubes. I'm confused a little bit about where you're dumping the water. And, and to clarify my thoughts, um, the first time I had an air conditioner installed in my house, the dehumidifying tube got kinked. And I ended up with water in my wall because that's where it was being dumped. Can you expound upon a little bit your design and where the water actually goes once it comes out of your reactor so there's a couple of possible different applications for our device that we have created one of them is in a gravity situation and another is in a zero gravity situation in a gravity situation it would be offset to a little tube but one thing to keep in mind is in our requirements it only has to run for 24 hours so after that 24 hour time period this water buildup can be removed or the, the device can be uh, stopped working or stopped being used for that time period. And in a zero gravity situation, it would be a longer set of the carbon nanotubes and yet again in a holding container. So this water would be ultimately offset to a holding container, but the kind depends on the, how much gravity you have. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nice job. So I think you just answered my question. So then the length of the carbon nanotube bundle would be long enough to, to accumulate all of the water produced in this under these constraints. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? I'm going to be really good at this next year. Uh, what, what do you perceive as uh, being kind of the, big, the biggest bottleneck of, of this going out from a supply chain perspective? I think the biggest bottleneck right now is um, not the availability of carbon nanotubes per se, but it's just the cost is almost double, but we do run it for 12, like 12 times longer than it should, it would be. So. Biggest, uh, yeah, biggest problem into this, this, biggest bottleneck is how much more it costs. It's almost double in price, but we are running it for 12 times as long. Thank you. All right, there seems to be no more questions from the judges. High power, let's give them a round of applause, please. All right, thank you so much. Now we ask you to uh, make your way out into the lobby and we're going to be taking some team pictures and certainly the whole alumni picture for this Aggies event. We are going to uh, stop our live stream while our judges deliberate and then we will come back for the award ceremony. Thank you for joining us.
right, we are now back to the live streaming of our Aggies event with uh, Los Alamos National Laboratories, where we have our students, you know, work so hard. If you have not seen the presentations, you could go back and check them out. But we have had teams working so very hard. Our mentors are very excited about it, very impressed. The judges had a real hard time figuring out who should be awarded all of these things. But each team is at uh, the first uh, top three will receive some scholarship money. And I know that they're waiting to find out. Are you guys ready to find out? Somebody make some noise. Oh, my goodness. All right, well, since you didn't have that much energy, I'm going to have, <laughs> I would like to introduce TJ Aldrich, who is here. He is our liaison here for the school uh, from Lanel. So can, can you come and tell our students how cool they are? Yeah, well, first I have to start with howdy. Howdy. All right, that's what I like to hear. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm TJ Ulrich. I am from Los Alamos National Lab, where I've spent the last uh, about 18 years as a research scientist, and uh, I'm now the University uh, Research and Relations Director here for Los Alamos at TAMU. And so I would like to thank all of you for participating in this event that w uh, we sponsored here, and thank the organizers, you know, Rodney and Shayla, and Don and everyone else that, that helped, uh, it, was, it was really great. Um, I couldn't though, it couldn't be done without all of the mentors. And this position I, that I just told you I've, I am now holding happened about two months ago and about one month ago I found out that this event was part of my new job. <laughs> so, Everything that that happened here, you know, not just relying on on the uh, the staff uh, from the uh, entrepreneurial uh, office, but the mentors. You know, I, I owe a, a lot of gratitude, and I, I think I have a few more beers to buy before uh, <laughs> before uh, they leave. In thanks that uh, they were able to come out. You know, they gave up their weekend and traveled all the way from Los Alamos, and so let's give them a big round of applause. And now uh, you say you didn't expect to work on this one, but you worked, and how much did you like Aggie's Invent? It was fantastic. That's right. <laughs> it is fantastic. Anyway, okay, we are ready now to announce our top three winners. Uh, in third place, actually, a little drum roll, please. Very good. Third place, we have Team Fog. Come on up here, please, Team Fog. We are going to stand right here and take some pictures. You guys get up there and there you go. Good job. Very good work. And of course, by the way, folks, you all know that you have worked really hard. You are all winners because we spent the whole weekend here. How many of you would, let, let's span, uh, let's, let's, let's look at this side. You put the camera this way. There we go. I have a question for you guys. How many of you would actually do an Aggies event again? There you go. So we are going to definitely provide you with the opportunity. Did you come here just for the food? Well, it doesn't matter. All right, Team Fog, third place. Let's give them a round of applause. I think we're good. OK, guys, let's wait over there. Let's wait over there, and now we're going to announce the second place winner. This team will win $750. Are we ready with that drum roll, please? Here we go. The winner is Ultrabot. Where's Ultrabot? There they are. Yes. I want to remind everyone that if you want to pursue, you know, what the inventions that you have come up with in only 48 hours, we have an incubator here. We can help you. Enter engineering entrepreneurship is interested in helping you maybe follow this through uh, to conception, to uh, maybe a, a startup or something like that. So we definitely have the resources for you all to continue if that's what you want. We want 
you guys to think like an entrepreneur. We want you to become an entrepreneur, and we will help you. All right. Is that good? Okay. Now for the first place team. <laughs> I think we're ready. What do you say? The Degenerators, get over here. Very well done. <laughs> I want to remind you all, and remember how far you've come. We have, do you remember last two days ago? It feels like 100 years ago. You made those uh, briefings and presentations, and all we did was to, to to remind you to not say so and like and to stop moving and you all have done a terrific job we could not be more proud of all of you this was not an easy thing to do this was a volunteer thing to do sure we fed you but you did put in all the time and the effort and hey in true Aggie fashion I really am very proud all of us are very proud so this was it um, until next time, this was Aggie's event number, I think, 44, my age, sure, um, <laughs> class of 83, I don't know, do the math. Listen, all of you, thank you for coming, thank you for joining us on the live stream, thank you Los Alamos National Laboratories for everything you've done, including the time uh, and the effort. So everyone, until next time, all right, bye-bye.